The 19th meeting of the 25th Council will come to order. Councillor Jones is excused this, uh, this evening. All other councillors are present. We'll start with a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance in English by Councillor Bassan and in Spanish by Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, councillors. Civic Plaza parking passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from council staff at the table near the chamber's en entrance. Uh, we uh, provide many ways to view the meeting, um, and that includes uh, four different platforms, GovTV on Comcast Channel 16, the GovTV website, YouTube, and also Zoom webinar. The live streams can be accessed from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. Also, this meeting is closed captioned, and you may enable the closed captioning on your device at this time. The video recordings of this and all uh, uh, council meetings in the past will remain available for viewing at any time on the city council website. So you can just call if you need help accessing that. You can call our office. 768-3100 during business hours, Monday through Friday. Uh, but it's very easy to get on and, and choose, uh, 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 choose something that you need to review, or if you miss something, you can go back and take a look at it. The council will take a break at approximately 7 p.m. this evening, if necessary. And as usual, with regard to decorum in the, count in the chambers, we do want the meeting to proceed civilly and respectfully, please do not make any personal attacks, and please no applause or other outbursts during the meeting. The meeting will go a lot smoother if we're respectful of one another. Um, <clears throat> anyone causing a disruption will be given one warning, and upon the second or continued disruption, the individual will be asked to leave the chambers and, if necessary, escorted out by security. Um, and that will uh, remain in effect for the remainder of the meeting. <clears throat> we'll move on to proclamations and presentations, starting with Councilors Grout, Feeblecorn, and Bassan. Mr. President, thank you. <clears throat> this proclamation is recognizing the National Homeless Youth Awareness Month, and I believe that we have Kathleen Wilging, Principal Investigator with the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation, Brooke Tafoya, CEO of New Day Youth and Family Services. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jennifer Weiss Burke, Executive Director of Serenity Mesa. Robert Sanchez, CEO of YDI. Jack Siamu, Senior Associate Director of Prevention Intervention and Behavioral Health of YDI. And Stephen Serrano, Program Director of Casa Q to accept if they want to join us at the front. <clears throat> And then while you all come up here, I'm gonna go ahead and start reading the proclamation. Thank you for being here. Whereas a February 2022 comprehensive needs assessment completed by the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation estimated that 1,200 to 2,300 young people between the ages of 16 and 25 are homeless or insecurely housed in Bernalillo County. And whereas while trying to survive on the streets, youth are exposed to countless dangers with an increased likelihood of substance abuse, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and vulnerability to being trafficked and. Whereas city leaders are engaging stakeholders to protect New Mexico youth who are experiencing homelessness and to create awareness of their immediate needs. And whereas if our community does not address the needs of our homeless youth now, we will face increasing challenges with our adult homeless population in the future. And whereas City Council has already secured significant funding to build a youth center for young people experiencing homelessness, 
because adult shelters do not typically provide services that are developmentally appropriate and youth often feel unsafe in adult shelters. And? Whereas City Council honors and recognizes the skilled and compassionate work and commitment of our own core youth service providers who support the need of young people experiencing homelessness 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, including YDI, New Day Youth and Family Services, CASA Q, and Serenity Mesa. Be it proclaimed that the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, hereby recognizes November 2022 as National Homeless Youth Awareness Month. Thank you. I'd like to ask Brooke Tafoya to speak on everybody's behalf. Thank you so much. Um, this group has been working together tirelessly for years uh, to build a comprehensive continuum of care for young people. And um, we're so grateful for the support of counselors, um, making a dream around a young adult shelter come more and more into reality every day. And we, the, the tireless work of this group and so many people who are standing behind us and out in the community uh, has really made it possible because we know the most dangerous night for a young person is the first night on the streets. And so our work is to prevent that first night from ever occurring. And if we're not able to do that, to then support the young people securing safe and secure housing as soon as possible. So we're so grateful for the community support around all of our young people, those 11 and all the way up to 25, and developing um, appropriate services that are trauma responsive and developmentally aligned and strength based. Thank you for your support. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we have a presentation on encampment policy. And uh, Dr. Or Director Matthew Whelan from Solid Waste will make the presentation. Welcome, Director. Thank you, uh, thank you, Council President, Councilors. We're gonna give a brief presentation on the city's encampment policy. And uh, for time purposes, I'll give the complete presentation. However, uh, all the other departments that are involved in this are here and will come up for questions at the end of the uh, of the presentation so we'll go ahead and get started first slide first. okay first slide so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to walk you through from the first step all the way through what we do um, and all these apartments are intertwined so it may say solid waste but within that there may be apd intervention there may be acs intervention or fcs so uh, first, we receive notice through various methods. Um, that can be electronically, through other city departments, constituent services, council services, or agencies outside that we work with. Residents should always call 311, or they can use the one Albuquerque, not the one Albuquerque app, the uh, ABQ 311 app. Or they can always go to the website, cabq.gov, and there's a uh, section there that says, how can we help? You can click on that and fill out and report an encampment. Once that happens, these, uh, these reports are routed to Solid Waste and Family and Community Services, who works in conjunction with Solid Waste to prioritize and assess these um, encampments. So what happens at that point is they're put on a list based on uh, receiving them. Then we have outreach coordinators go out. If there are individuals at the encampment, FCS has outreach coordinators that work with Solid Waste that go out and they assess the encampment to prioritize it based on the policy. If there are no individuals present, solid waste management employees can go and assess the encampment because they don't have any public engagement. However, they can look at an encampment with their supervisor and assess the need. <laughs> Next slide. So the way we prioritize them is priority one is considered an immediate hazard. Immediate hazards are any encampment that put people in immediate danger, whether it's the people at the encampment or the general public that has to use that area. Um, once it's prioritized, it can be located in a public park where we work with parks and recreation, and that's uh, an immediate hazard would be wherever there is children's programming, um, adjacent to a community center, senior center, multi-generational center, 
early childhood development or anything like that, or it can be impeding a sidewalk, which would cause either the person encamping on the sidewalk could be at a hazard of a car coming up and uh, addressing it, or if a resident is walking down a sidewalk and they then have to go into an immediate danger of the street to go around the encampment. Those are just, would be considered an immediate hazard. Those can be removed immediately. Priority two encampments meet one or more of this criteria. They're located in an underpass near a roadway, five or more encampment residents and or a structure is present, human waste is present, or significant quantities of hypodermic needles are present. This, we give a, a notice and we let them know that it needs to be moved immediately. And you can see here on the slide, this is how we give notice. And the priority three is anything that doesn't meet priority one or priority two. And these are the notices that we give. There's two copies, we fill them out. You can see there that it's in English and in Spanish, and this is how we track everything that we do. One copy is left with the encampment. If there are individuals present, we, give that to, we hand that to them through one of our outreach providers. If there is nobody present, we tape it to the uh, tent or structure or whatever it is, and we take a picture and document that we were there, and then this is entered into our system. Next. So, initial engagement is usually done by an FCS uh, Family and Community Service Outreach Coordinator. They inform and offer available services. They assess and provide notice. They provide storage, um, as we're working on that through a request for bid, to provide storage for individuals, or we engage additional city departments as necessary. So if they get there and they need ACS, they will contact Albuquerque Community Safety. If APD is needed, they'll contact APD. If Metro Security, then Metro Security. If it's at a park, we work in conjunction with parks. Uh, Albuquerque Community Safety, they can do transport to additional services, resources, or other providers, or add additional intervention if necessary. APD and Metro Security, they can address any criminal activity or violent individuals, provide enforcement as ACS, solid waste, and family and community services. We do not have enforcement um, capabilities, but APD can provide that enforcement. And they can provide protection for outreach providers if necessary, or if we're cleaning a, an encampment and there are some hostile individuals there, they can help us there to provide protection. Albuquerque Fire and Rescue would be engaged if uh, there are fires at the encampments, which we do see a lot of during the winter time. So they can go in and address those. They can provide medical assistance and they can remove needles if necessary. Now these are for all encampments on public property. So Albuquerque Community Safety's role in encampments is they have two street outreach responders dedicated to involving unsheltered individuals and encampments. They have behavioral health responders that are called out when there is an acute behavioral crisis occurring. They don't come out and assess. A couple of things to really understand about that is they'll make contact at initial engagement if requested. It's always family and community services outreach providers that go first. If we need to access or engage ACS, then we do. Um, they give prior to the removal of the 72 hours, if we give a 72 hour notice and we feel like those people need more attention, we would refer that to ACS and within those 72 hours, they will go back out and make additional contact. They can assess basic needs, provide referrals, engage in cabinet residents, and this is what's critical. They want to engage them before any enforcement is necessary. They're really there to just really try and offer as much help as possible. ACS does not provide formal notices and they don't participate in the removal of encampments. However, during outreach, they do provide an informal notice letting people know that they're in violation of the city's policy and that a notice could be given or will be given. Uh, again, the preferred method for the community members to report encampments is via 311. FCS, solid waste management, or ACS will be engaged at that time and ACS does not play a role in enforcement or in the removal of the actual encampments. That's done by solid waste. Next slide. Next slide. Where are we? Where are we? Solid waste, okay. So what is solid waste's role? Well, we receive all of the 311s or electronic things that people send us, whether it's an email from another department, whether it's from council or anything like that. We work with FCS to, outreach, to coordinate outreach, and we work together to prioritize our cleanups every week. Um, it's an internal group that meets every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. At our Monday meetings, we have everybody involved, which includes APD, planning, code enforcement, parks and rec, family and community services, transit, AMAFCA, APS, New Mexico Department of Transportation, Metro Development, Rio Grande Conservancy, AFD and AFR, and Bernalillo County Metro and Metro Security. So at this Monday meeting, we look at what we have and we assess what's needed. At that Monday meeting, we have people bring things to us or we may tell APD, hey, we got a report for an encampment that was a, it's a 72 hour notice. Can you go out and just see if they're still there and let us know? 
That way, if they let us know that there's nobody there anymore, well, now it's just a cleanup and we can just send uh, solid waste. Cleanups are scheduled and completed weekly. On our Wednesday and Friday meetings, those are done kind of on an as-needed basis. On Monday, we all meet together. Based on that meeting, we decide whether we need people to meet with us on Wednesday or Friday to continue to, to see what encampments we're doing and where we're at with our encampments. Next slide. At a cleanup, all trash in the immediate area of the encampment is removed and disposed of. At this point, we have two supervisors and 11 crew members. However, that has increased to four supervisors and 20 crew members because we've gotten more equipment. We are still pending about 10 more positions, but we are waiting on equipment because we've ordered trucks and we've ordered our rear packers, six yard rear packers that aren't here yet. So we can't bring the staff on until we have vehicles to transport them into the cleanup scene. So right now we have four, three encampment crews and four cleanup crews. So we're using those to address those throughout the city. Additional outreach is offered at, at each cleanup by FCS, or if ACS is needed, we engage them. They can determine the availability of beds, any immediate health issues, they offer water, snacks, or anything that they may need, and they can contact other agencies if transportation is needed. We keep all records through ViewWorks of any 311s or anything that we address. Those include number of encampments, time, number of vehicles, photos before and after, personnel cost, and resident contact when warranted. Next slide. So that's for public right-of-ways, but when it comes to parks, the Parks and Recreation Department works hand-in-hand -hand with us as they have park cleanup crews that address encampments in city parks. And they've taken a proactive approach as they meet with us as well. And it's a joint effort between us and FCS. So for encampments in a park, we still have to send an outreach coordinator from Family and Community Services to engage them to let them know what's available to them, but also to provide notice. Some parks are cleaned immediately because of where they're located, they're deemed immediate hazards. Others are scheduled within 24 hours based on availability of staff and availability of outreach providers. They also have a list of parks that we consider um, hot spots that we check either on a daily basis or every other day. Their crews check them and they address them if they can. If they need additional resources or more manpower, then they engage solid waste management to work with them to get them addressed. Um, this is all set up through the Monday meeting. Parks and Rec also works with APD and Metro Security to remove encampments that have not been addressed, and they address any encampment on bikes, trails, and any open space area. Next slide. Parks and Rec has a proactive approach. They're adding different gates, fences, lights. They're faster response and shorter notices so camps don't get bigger. They work in close coordination with APD. They do park patrols both day and night, and they're starting to design and program temp programming for their parks that are tamper-proof cages for controllers, irrigation equipment that's stronger, fencing material, reduced plants, vegetation to limit shelter and park activation and feature programming. Uh, citations for vandalisms and criminal activities are done through APD in conjunction working with Parks and Rec. Next slide. So now we'll talk about um, encampments that are on private property. If an encampment is on a private property, then we must engage the planning department so that they can send out their code enforcers. Once their code enforcers go out there, they can contact the appropriate owner to let them know that they need to either clean it up or they need to address the problem, let them know if they need to put no trespassing signs so that APD can be engaged, or if it's a substandard dwelling where nobody is living, they want to make sure that they tag it as an, a substandard building that it's unsafe to, to occupy. Um, whenever there's unsecure or weeds or anything like that that require work, if they've tried to notify the owner and they can't get a hold of the owner and it begins continues to be a nuisance, then they engage Solid Waste Management Department, and we do what's called a clean and lean. We'll clean it and put a lien on the property for the cost. Next slide. <clears throat> they can't have, uh, these kind of encampments can't be on private property because of the IDO, and if you look there, you can read the definition of what it is, but when tents and vehicles or other structures are erected on private property in a zone category that's not allowed by the IDO, code enforcers address that at that time and let them know that they are in violation and they can fine if necessary. APD and solid waste assist code enforcement with removing the encampments, and we also do not just uh, clean and leans, we also do board ups. So if a building needs to be boarded up, we will board it up, and then that cost will be put towards the property, lean on the property. Next slide. Uh, AFR, oh, next slide, sorry. This is the same slide. Yeah, but they have one. I apologize, they had an additional slide. AFR has its ADAPT program, and AFR dispatches in response to all reports of fires in open and homeless encampments. 
and they ensure that all laws and ordinance are enforced by the responding crews. They have an available phone number for current, current or burning um, areas where you may see an encampment with a fire, you can contact them. They hand out flyers on a regular basis to inform those experiencing homeless that of the encampment's restrictions and that they can't have fires. But they are also engaged at any moment when we may need somebody with medical, that needs medical attention when we're doing the, either the cleaning of the encampment or the assessment of the encampment. We can always engage AFR, and they're also part of our meetings. Next. Throughout this whole process, APD can be engaged at any time whenever we need them based on the policy and based on uh, the, the factors I said earlier about safety and those things. But what they'll do is they'll respond for call, calls for service related to encampments, arrive and confirm actual encampments is present. That's where I was saying sometimes we may ask them to go look at an area to see if it's still an encampment of, with individuals there or if it's just an encampment with, that's had stuff left there. Uh, they can contact any individuals present, identify any violation of laws, erection of a structure pu on public property without mayor's written consent, criminal trespassing, obstructing movement, public nuisance, drug possession, paraphernalia, or any other witness criminal activity. They can also identify individuals suspected of criminal activity and confirm no warrants or see if they do have warrants. They can take enforcement if warranted. Next slide. They also can offer resources, ACS, FCS, Street Connect, and HopeWorks, and they, always, they can always call out solid waste or the encampment team for any cleanups that are needed, or they can inform us at our Monday meeting, and we always have APD on our Monday, Wednesday, and Friday meetings. We have the area commanders so we can address any encampments. A lot of times we have the same encampments on the master list that they see, so we just want to reconfirm who's out there and what we'll need to address the encampments. If medical conditions are identified, AFR can be called. If, uh, if a location has recurring problems, they can do field briefings in that area and do periodic watches to, uh, in that area so that those encampments don't begin to grow or so that they can continue to move them out of that area. And that's it. I hope I didn't go too fast. Good job, Director. That was a lot. Um, we'll get started with questions from counselors. Councilor Lewis. Hey, Mr. President and Director, you say you have a master list. How many are current on that? How many currently? Uh, how many are on that master list right now? Uh, Council President and Councilor Lewis, I'd have to get that number for you. The list gets kind of big because we may have. Um, eight, you can have up to ten calls for one area. And uh, when it comes to 311, they prioritize them all the same. When we get them, we make sure that we combine them and make sure that we're not, if we have 10 calls for one location, we, we make that really that's one location as on our master list, even though it may have 10 calls. And then they're prioritized based on how we assess them, if it's level one, level two, or level three. And the thing about that is we can, my guys can come in in the morning and we have a list of encampments that we need to clean. Maybe they're coming up on the 72-hour notice and we know that they're going to be there. There's nobody there and we can clean them, or they may be a priority two. But then we may have gotten four or five level ones, priority ones, that shoot to the top of the list. So you have, a, you have a master list. I mean, do you, do you keep that master list? We do have a list of, of the encampment. Is there another list, or do you have the master list? Well, everything funnels through solid waste. However, Parks and Recreation does have their list of their parks and how they address their parks. Okay, so everybody has different lists, or...? No, uh, Councilor President, Councilor Lewis, no, not, we have, everybody has kind of an individual list, but we do have a master list. So when a, when a call is made, who, who exactly makes the decision on the priority, one, two, or three? Uh, Council President, Councilor Lewis, it comes into 311, and then it comes to us and Family and Community Services, and the so it goes it goes to your department? Most of them do, unless it's in a park, or if it needs to be a, a trail, then it would go to Parks and Rec, it would go to a department, but... We meet with them, so sometimes we already gotten that on our list by somebody seeing it. So it goes to you, the ones that it. go to you, and then you make the decision on the one, two, three? Uh, Council President, Council Lewis, uh, the Family and Community Service Outreach Providers can make that assessment. Our, in, our the employees... ACS, the ACS? Or? No, no, Family and Community Services. Okay, Family so, and Community Services. Yes, so. uh, Albuquerque uh, Safety does not assess encampments. They'll just offer assistance. So if there so are family, again, family community services, they're the ones who make the assessment on the priority. Uh, council president, council. And then they tell you which one, which priority it is. We can make that assessment with them. Solid waste management can. So we okay. work in conjunction with a FCS. So yeah. their outreach providers work with us on a daily basis. So basically, in the morning, we have our encampment crew and the FCS uh, coordinators with us. So they can drive by one and say there's individuals there and make an assessment with one of our supervisors. Or if it's 
if there is nobody there where there won't have to be any engagement, our supervisor can make that. Uh, how long does that usually take? A call is made to 311. How long um, does it take before there's a response? Uh, Council President and uh, Councilor Lewis, it all depends on the encampment and what we have on our list. But we try and get to them as soon as possible. hours? We try and get to them. Typically what? We try and assess them within 24 hours. OK. Um, and then and then I guess you're, you're, you're constantly looking at what, what priority it is. and. Mm -hmm. You go from there. Okay. Um, I guess it's just it's just interesting that um, that it seems like your department owns this whole process, you know. And I know that you're dealing with a lot of symptoms, and you're you're doing your job, and and we work together in several examples. And your department has done a phenomenal job, by the way. Um, I just find it interesting that a lot of this, a lot of the ownership of this whole process falls on your department. Um, a council president and councilors, you know, the, re the way we have it designed is so that the hub is, is kind of us, so that what, was, what doesn't happen is we get people calling ACS, FCS, another department, and then we're kind of showing up at, at a park when Parks and Rec has already addressed it. I don't think that's really clear, though. I really don't. I think you got family, you got you guys, you got, you know, um, and again, it's just unclear a little bit about who, who really truly owns it, who's making the decisions, and you know, who's carrying that master list and prioritizing those. I mean, I think it seems like there's kind of multiple. So, so Council department. President and uh, Council I apologize. It is us with FCS. We, yeah. we work in conjunction with FCS on a daily basis. So the 311s come in and actually the, uh, the FCS outreach manager enters into our master spreadsheet as well as one of our supervisors do because they work hand in hand together. They're actually, they start their day with us. They end their day with us. They are actually housed in our clean cities build okay. and uh, at what point in the process is a citation given uh, council president council Lewis that would be whenever there's no trespassing and we engage APD and then APD would have to come and determine if there's a, a citation to be given because we don't have any enforcement capability you know do you know how many citations have been given uh, council president council last Lewis, few years that would be a question for APD and so we have all of our directors here, or a spokesperson from each department. Yeah, I'd like to know, say, in the last three or four years, how many citations have been given for illegal you know, camping in public spaces or even private property? Uh, Do you have that information? Um, I'll have a deputy chief from APD come on up. Deputy Chief Brown, welcome. President uh, Mr. Lewis, so since like the end of Balloon Fiesta, I don't have the stats going back three years. So, but I can tell you within the last since Balloon Fiesta, so what a couple weeks, um, it's about 199 citations in that time period. So you've given 199 citations for illegal camping. Uh, not directly for illegal camping. That's a culmination of criminal trespass, erection of structures, uh, a lot of uh, possession of drug paraphernalia. Um, all that kind of different misdemeanors, plus there's been numerous felony arrests in that same time period. And, and that's since when? Since Balloon Fiesta? It's the end of Balloon Fiesta. Yes, do, you know, do, you know, do you know how many citations have been given just for um, illegal encampments? I do not have that. I can okay. get that for you. Though. Have we given any for that? Have we ever given a citation just because somebody's, um, you know, has a, an encampment and living in that encampment? Part of that is the erection of structures that set up in the city ordinance. So there isn't anything specifically for like illegal camping. It's the erection of structures, and that's kind of what we go off of on the city ordinances. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Bassan, and then Councilor Sanchez. Mr. President, thank you for asking for this presentation. Uh, I a couple short questions. How often, um, or generally, how often are encampments still in the location uh, that they were? you were first notified 72 hours before that. Uh, Are most of them still there? Uh, can you say that again? So if you, we have the 72 hour warning. And so when, you know, the first notification comes in and then 72 hours later, someone goes out, how often is that same encampment still there? Uh, Council President, uh, Council Bassan, it depends. Sometimes that's why we would have, we even use AFR on our Monday meeting, like when we give a 72 hour notice to an area that's not an immediate hazard. It might, it's out of the way. Um, we asked them if somebody 
at their station could go by and take a picture and send it to us after, you know, if it's been a day or two. A lot of times what happens is within the 72 hours, they move on, and then that's when we just send a cleanup crew. We know that we, need, we don't need to send additional outreach providers. We don't need to engage ACS. We don't need to engage APD. We know that what is left there is now just truly illegal dumping, so we can send a litter crew as opposed to having to send one of our encampment crews. Um, but there are times when you do show up and the 72 hours has passed and you know that there are people that are going to be there. So sometimes that's when we'll have to engage APD because they may be taking the stand that they're not going anywhere. Um, but we monitor that through the three days, you know, and that's why sometimes we will request Albuquerque Community Safety to go and do a second visit because like the slide showed, they really want to engage with that community before any, um, before any enforcement has to take place. So they kind of go and say, hey, you guys know you can't be here. You've been given your notice. They're going to be coming. So um, we try and go through every avenue before we have to engage APD. Thank you. And then also, what happens, uh, how often when you go back after the 72 hours, maybe the same encampment is not exactly there, but nearby? How does that get treated? Is it, you know, I mean, if they're just a half a block away, does that get counted as they've been moved, they've technically moved, or is that still something that is not encompassed in that? Uh, Council President, Councilor Bassan. So usually we kind of look at it within a half a block radius or a block radius. If they just kind of say, okay, we're just going to move right over here, well, they've already been given notice because they're in the same area, they're in the same thing. Technically, they need to be cleared of that area, that general area. So that's what we tell them, and that's what we tell them, they, you know, whether it's two blocks away or wherever they end up going. We don't just let them move 10 feet and then they say, we hey, we moved. No, you need to be out of this area. You can't be on a sidewalk. And one of the things we also do is we let them know, say they move a block away, but they're still on the sidewalk. We say, okay, you, you're, now you're in an immediate hazard because you've already been given a 72-hour notice. You've been told you can't be in this area. You've been told this is, can be an immediate hazard. And then from that point, we can engage them even quicker. Thank you, Director. I think that that makes sense. I, I like to hear that where we're trying our best. And I know you all have been, so I appreciate that, that it's, it seems like it's becoming more of a common sense approach while still trying to find that balance. And just lastly, I want to say thank you to, to you, Director Willen, and also to the other directors who I regularly do email, uh, Councillor Lewis, part of what you were suggesting. That's why when I, when I do reach out about a particular encampment, I don't know necessarily what part of the process, but I have heard about it and learned about it enough that I do make sure to copy all of you directors. So thank you, and, and APD, and so thank you for your patience with that because it, it is something that I feel like we're seeing results, or at least when the, when the ones that I end up reaching out about, I'm seeing results and so is my district, but um, I appreciate your patience and, and consistency with that. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Director Whelan, thank you so much for uh, working on this and putting it together. Um, I have three, co three questions and a comment. should be pretty quick. Um, first question is 311. How is our access to 311 right now? Do we have that operational 24 hours a day, seven days a week, like it was in the past? Or is there a certain hours that we um, can call 311 and, and get help? Uh, Council President, Councilor Sanchez. So as of right now, 311 through the phone call, through a phone call dialing 311 is Monday through Saturday from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. and then on Sunday from 9 p.m. to 6 p.m. That's through doing it through a phone call. However, they do have the ABQ uh, 311 app that you can access on your phone anytime and you can enter the information there and it goes straight to their system and then this, the very next day they get sent out to where they need to be. So if you were to report an encampment at 11 o'clock at night, when they, they come in at 6, if it's a Monday through Saturday, they would address it in, through the system. Uh, also, through that 311 app, that does dispatch through de to departments. So we do get an email um, from the app that tells us what was there. And then the, for those who don't have the app or can't call 311, if you have a computer, you can literally just go to cabq.gov backslash how can we help, and you can report it through there anytime. Thank you, Director. Um, another question that I had, it follows along with, uh, with uh, Councillor Bassan and also Councillor Lewis's idea as to how the encampment works in terms of the cleanup and moving it over. Is there any signage that you can actually incorporate to actually make sure that these individuals know that they can't reaccess this location, whether it's public or private, um, based on the fact that we've been here before, um, some sort of signage that they that could be put on a building 
or even on a park or a location. Um, that means that so, so, so if somebody else comes back around, maybe you can make it more immediate instead of waiting another 72 hours if you have a whole new person setting up an encampment. That seems to be it would help expedite your ability to get there. Uh, Councilor uh, President and Councilor Sanchez, we don't have an actual sign that solid waste uses, but we do have the NMDOT puts up there no trespassing signs. When it's on private property, we tell the owners through planning that they need to put up no trespassing signs. And when it comes to parks, Director Simon is here, and uh, he can have somebody come up and speak because I know different parks, there are different signages depending on if there's children's programming there, depending on what it's used for during the day and those kind of things. And so they address them a little bit different. I know they have signs that talk about when they're open and when they're closed. So I don't know if you need more information than that. I'm still kind of confused. I just want to know if there's an encampment and you clear it out and three days later there's another encampment and it's a different person or you clear that one out and there's another encampment and it just keeps on happening. How are you addressing the situation so that we don't have a encampment keep happening at the same location every two or three days uh, by different people? Uh, Council President, Council Sanchez, we don't have an actual sign that says once we clear an encampment, you cannot camp here or you'll be removed. Um, if we did that, there would be a lot of them all over the city, I think. Okay, does legal have an idea on how we can address that so we don't have it happening over and over and over and somebody just keep moving into the same spot? Um, Council President, Council Sanchez, uh, there is at least some notice requirement. It's unclear in the law what that notice requirement is, but the notice wouldn't transfer. So if you provided notice to one person who's camping and, and the city has chosen 72 hours, um, that doesn't mean that the next person who comes in camp has some kind of notice. You would still have to provide notice to that next person. Okay, thank you. And now the last um, question that I have is I've been contacted recently by different individuals who have told me that they've reported encampment or drug dealing or something related to some homelessness, and it's mostly criminal activity that's related to the homelessness, that they call and they report the criminal activity either at their place of business or on a public, at their place of business, and what happens next is they're hit with a code violation. So they feel like they've made the phone call um, when they need help, and now all of a sudden they're hit with a code violation from the city. Um, so it almost feels like re retaliation um, to the individuals who are actually calling in the Ill illegal activity that's occurring on their premises. Uh, Council President, Council Sanchez, I know we do have somebody from planning here as well as APD again to address that question. Um, like I said, we don't have any enforcement capabilities and you know, we just come out and assess an encampment. If we do, if when we are doing our assessment, we do see illegal activity, that's when we do engage APD. And we have been in encampments where people have been found to have warrants and they've been arrested, um, where they have gotten citations. So that would be um, for maybe or I wasn't clear. Um, I'm talking about the code side of it. If when someone comes in, you know, you call, call the code team out in reference to a private encampment or a encampment happening on private property, what I'm trying to make sure that doesn't happen is I'm trying to make sure that uh, this individual calls the calls 311, reports the private encampment, and then all of a sudden um, the city sees a code violation and tags them with that, and now they're feeling like, wow, we just called the police because we reported criminal activity and now we're getting hit with a code violation. So I just wanna make sure that um, the citizens aren't experiencing that on their private property. Maybe some sort of warning, some sort of other way to deal with that. President Benton, Councillor Sanchez. So generally what we do is if we get a, a, a call on a property where there's encampment going on, the city does need to notify the owner in order to not only get it clean, but it is still their responsibility to keep it clean. But in, insta in, a, in an instance like this, what we would do is we would, uh, when they contact us, we would tell them, okay, now that we got a hold of you, can you please do us a favor and put up no trespassing signs? We actually have some that we give out so they could put it on their property. And then, if they, and then we also say if, the, if, the, if you don't feel safe getting them off, if you just give us permission, we'll work with APD and with solid waste. 
if, if needed to get it cleaned if, 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 if that's necessary if we do have to take a, a rear loader or anything they are they'll take one for us and you know we, we, we can get that cleaned up thank you mr. Metzger um, thank you for all your help by the way as well um, anytime I've needed some help in my district um, Andrew's been right there to help me out so I just want to say appreciate your help and um, if you can just make sure I just want to make sure that that it doesn't feel like retaliation to the individual. Yeah. So as long as you're making contact, and as long as you continue to make contact and let them know what's going on, um, then at that point, I feel okay with that. And now the last comment along the lines of saying thank you is I noticed my Southwest PRT team up here um, that helped me and Counselor Pena a lot. So I just wanna say a quick shout out to, uh, to Sergeant Lujan and his group, thank you. Question now from Councillor uh, Hassan, or let's see, you got yours. Um, uh, Councillor Grout followed by Councillor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. I just have one question about the overnight, um, about parking um, near the community centers and parks. Um, is there any overnight parking allowed? Uh, Council President and Councillor Grout, I can have either planning come back up or Parks and Rec come up to address that question about parks. I do know that parks are closed and that would include, if I'm correct, uh, the parking area. So as, as the park is closed, you shouldn't be in the parking area and I think they could be addressed, but Director Simon can, can answer that question. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, Councilors, uh, Council President and uh, Councilor uh, Grout. When it comes to community centers, which of course family and community uh, department, those parking lots are closed at night and, and no parking is permitted. Uh, in, in other cases where there are park parking lots, we try to close gates where we have them. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Another, just a follow up to that. Mm -hmm. um, how many parks and open space trails have gates? Uh, Mr. President, <coughs> Councilor Grout, I think we have a little under 50 local. Uh, sites that have gates and who's responsible for closing those and opening them counselor it's a it's a mix of responsibilities we try to uh, use the right tool for the situation so in it, it depends on the location when it comes to closing gates we rely on um, a wide multitude of partners so our GSD Metro security closes some gates um, Family and Community Services, of course, closes some gates. Our park management staff close gates. Uh, our open space st staff close gates. Uh, in a few places, APD, particularly the open space unit of APD, closes gates. Uh, okay. Our partners at Albuquerque Public Schools, APS, close some gates for us. And in a few cases, we have neighborhood associations helping us out. And then a another small set, we have actually automatic gates. Councillor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I wanted to start with just a thank you to the directors of all the departments that are working on these encampments. Um, I spoke to some folks that were in an encampment in my district down the street from my house, and they all said, even though they were they had been served, they were going to be moved along, um, that they were treated with respect and kindness. And I just really want to thank everyone for making that happen. Um, I just wanted a quick question for you, Director. Um, if somebody say uses the 311 app and puts in a request for a decampment and it's a priority three. What length of time should they expect between the time that they, you know, file the report to when they see somebody out at the, at the property? Um, that's just a question that we get a lot um, and I just wanted to be able to give them a good, a good solid, you know, if you haven't seen anyone in blank amount of time, you should be re reporting it again or what's the average turnaround? Uh, Councilor President and Councilor Fibelcorn, um, we currently have four outreach providers, and like I said, those would be there are four outreach providers and one manager who does outreach as well, so we have five. Um, if there are individuals at the site, you know, they try and make contact as soon as they can. If there are no individuals there, if it's un, that one, that one is quicker because then our solid waste crews can just go. Um, we try and get the notice out as quickly as possible. It really is based on how many 311s we get. If there are a lot of 311s, we get to them based on how they're received and based on 
what the area is. It's not so much based on if this one has 15 calls and this one has one call. We, you know, when they come in, we do group them by call, so, um, but we try to get to them as they come in, and then we try and get eyes on them as soon as possible. And that's why our Monday coordination meeting is very important because a lot of these other departments and a lot of the area commanders, they can tell us at that meeting, like, hey, this encampment is really bad. So we'll know right away that they, you know, we'll probably go and it's probably going to be a level one because they all understand what an immediate hazard level one is. They understand what a level two is. And we also send out this, uh, emails to other areas to say, hey, can you go look at this? You know what I mean? Because we kind of have so many departments, especially with AFR and APD being on the streets, we kind of use them as our eyes and ears. That's why we meet every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just so that we can say, hey, what does this look like? So I think it's a good approach. That way we can send the outreach providers as soon as possible to really assess the encampment or to give the 72-hour notice. And that's why Solid Waste Management and FCS are the only two departments that actually give out those notices so that we can make sure and keep it all and track everything that we're doing. Thank you for that. I just So if somebody puts in a, a level three um, report and they don't see anybody at, this, at the site for say five days, should they know that you're still coming or should they should they be worried that the report hasn't been processed? That I just I just yeah. don't know how long to tell them to wait before they complain again. Uh, Council President and Council People Quorn, you know, because we do give a 72 hour notice, I would ask that we get that a much amount of time. We try and get somebody to put eyes on it within 24 hours. Within 24 but, yeah, hours. Yeah, we try to get somebody, whether it's another department or one of our highway crews or somebody that we have out in the field to try and look at it so we can get kind of a preliminary assessment. But if they haven't seen anything in 24 to 48 hours, they could, should put another one in. That's very helpful. Thank you. Councilors, any other questions? Uh, I have a quick one before uh, Councilor Lewis has a follow-up. Um, this uh, business of no trespassing signs, I've heard it different ways, and maybe this is a question for the city attorney, for APD. I've, I've heard it different ways. I've heard uh, it said that, that uh, police cannot um, enter a private property to remove someone who's there uh, against the will of the owner unless there is a no trespassing sign. And I've heard that, that, uh, that the opposite is true. And I see D.C. Brown coming down. I'm sure he's very familiar with what the requirements are here. Thank you. Mr. President, just so I'm, I'm clear on your question. So the question is, is essentially that we can't enter a private property or remove someone unless there's a sign. So that's, that's a, a, a falsehood because we've been telling our officers as I took over as deputy chief, is if somebody calls and asks for our assistance on this, their public or private property, our officers will take some sort of enforcement action. That person will not be allowed to stay on uh, private property at all. So they can either be uh, criminally trespassed, cited, and if, if there's you know, a violation of law, um, other than the simple criminal trespass, they can be taken to jail. So they, we would never leave someone on somebody's private property and tell you, sorry, have a good day. And we worked really hard on this. Um, all the way since January and before, um, my thing is, is if somebody's on there and they're asking for our help and it's their property, you have the right to your property and we're not going to leave somebody on your private property. So, so the sign is something that's helpful in so some the cases. The sign is something that's helpful if, if that person's not there. So the area commanders have done a really good job of reaching out to property owners, uh, a lot of businesses, and, and getting that buy-in to have that signage there and having that constant partnership. Because a lot of it is, is if, if, you know, these calls come in, on a couple different ways, right? So we either have a, uh, a call for service or we get flagged down. We get a lot of constituent service calls from y'all. Um, and if that person calls in and they don't have a sign, say if it's a residence, a lot of residences don't have no trespassing signs on them. And mine doesn't have one. I'm sure a lot of people don't have one on it. But if it's a business, most of them do. Um, but where that helps out is, is if it's a business, private property, it's a lot. And you know, if, if there's nothing there and we can't contact an owner, I mean, it's, it's hard without the actual owner being present on those, on those instances. But there are times we've worked out, especially in the southeast. Um, I know uh, Commander Braz is here, Commander Wheeler's here. They've worked really hard with their business communities to, to say, hey, you know what, we, we need your signage up. Um, and they've, they've gotten the, the buy-in from the community as well to say, if you, know, you have these up here and we're willing to prosecute for them, then we can take enforcement action on that side as well. All right, thank you. Um, another question has to do, this came up just recently, 
with a constituent, a business constituent, and actually a, a resident of District 2, uh, with regard to alleys. And uh, this, this, uh, this uh, is a business owner with an alley behind uh, his business. And um, somebody's camping back there, or there's, you know, they're making regular reports. And um, who, uh, what, what governs that uh, camping in an alley? That would be the same as uh, public property, and that would fall under the like the uh, encampment protocols that Director Whalen and Solid Wastes and everybody else we kind of follow. Is that would come in through the 311, and then it would get divvied out from there. And the final thing, like that APD would look at that, is is there erection of structures? Is there other criminal activity? Okay, so it's an obstruction of a right of way, in other words. It would be yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Lewis. Had a quick question, and we'll get to you, Councillor Sanchez. I think that I, I think that's my. Uh, let me make sure I have my other. Um, I've talked about this with Parks, and and uh, we can talk about this more in the future. But I know that that we've talked about uh, so certain parks. So hours have been limited. The others they still the same as they've always been, which is like 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. or something like that. Um, is there? Is that? I'm I'm sure that that you're aware of which ones have those hours and which ones have the more limited hours. Is that right? I apologize, Council President. I'm, well, I'm well half with regard to parks think, hours. Oh, parks hours. I, I know that that you know parks has their own portfolio with regard to camping, but but um, during the hours when uh, parks are closed, uh, they're not all the same. Some of them are are shorter uh, periods of time that that they're uh, closed during the evening than others. Are you and your uh, officers kept apprised of that and understand? when and where you could go to a park to enforce it being closed? Councilor, uh, President, yes, sir. So that's part of the encampment meetings that they have Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays is relaying that information if a park hours change or if, you know, some, something happens at a different park that didn't happen before. Uh, that way everybody's on the same sheet of music. All the officers have that information. Uh, we don't want to send our officers out there with, with misinformation or, you know, we get that directly um, from Parks and Rec themselves, like when, when, they, when that those hours are closed when they're open. All right. Thank you. Councillor Lewis yes, and then Councillor Sanchez. And Mr. President, just, just some comments, uh, not necessarily for either Mr. Whelan or uh, E.C. Brown. But um, in my experience, uh, um, the, uh, each of the departments have done you know, a really good job, I think, in some, some certain you know, experiences. And on the west side there, um, you know, APD, very responsive, did a really good job. Officers are great. You know, solid waste. You know, you know, came along several instances and one pretty, pretty good size uh, encampment and just you know, crews were awesome and just did a great job. And, um, and then of course ACS and, and family and planning actually was in, was involved in some of that. Um, and my, I, I guess, and, and I appreciate the presentation. I think really good process that we have in place. I, if my suggestion would really be that I think what's 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 missing or what could be missing is just the coordination. Uh, between that and I think that's probably fallen a little bit more on on uh, director Whelan and his department and and maybe maybe that's the place for it maybe there's a, a special unit kind of like the safe city strike force that was very effective uh, that kind of had a, a single purpose and had a and had the responsibility for it they owned it and then they coordinated. they didn't do all the work they coordinated with the other departments and so I think again in my experience the the issue that I think that was lacking is just the coordination between all of them I mean we talked to ACS and family and planning and APD and, and solid waste and there was there were some times where I think was lacking is just what's everybody doing and everybody has different priorities or maybe assesses it a little bit differently. Um, everybody is um, uh, you know has different different parts of what they're doing to jump in and so that's again that's my my suggestion is that we would look at uh, a, an area where someone's calling the shots you know someone's actually saying. You know, I'm following this situation all the way to the to the solution to it, and coordinating with all the departments together. And I'm not suggesting a new department or maybe even a new position, although this might be a good, um, well, this might be a good unclassified you know position for the administration to hire. Just add one more. But anyways, um, it, it's got to be. A, there's got to be a um, you know a specific I think area of responsibility. So, uh, Councilor President, Councilor Lewis, uh, thanks for that comment and just um, to give you guys an update, and I, I didn't touch on it on the slide, but there was a line in there where uh, solid waste, you know, we kind of are the hub with FCS right now. And 
currently we have a certain amount of crews, but we got a rate increase to beef up our encampment team. So what we're basically going to do is we're going to create an encampment division. Um, so we will have an encampment division within the Clean Cities Division. So that encampment division will be responsible for all the encampments working, and they'll, will, they'll be more of the hub and more of the centralized location, as you're saying. Uh, and once we get the vehicles that we've ordered, once we fill probably about 14 positions, it will have its own division manager. So it'll have somebody who's running that division who will be doing all the coordinating with all the other departments at, like we currently do on Monday, but it'll be more dedicated because right now we're using people from clean cities. And that crew will eventually, we will have a central location where they'll be located. There'll be one dedicated six yard truck to each quadrant of the city. So every morning that truck will be dispatched into that quadrant to address any of the, any of the encampments on the list for that quadrant. So every morning they'll have their list, they'll go there, but we'll have an additional two crews that we'll have, um, that those can be more like triage crews for immediate hazards so that we can get to these 72 hour notices quicker. So we can give notice quicker. And so we'll also have one extra crew to help work with transit on the art corridor. So we do have the, the positions are created. We do have the funding for it. We're just getting the bodies and the equipment to do that so that we can have a more ro robust um, approach and so we can have a more coordinated approach to addressing this. Director, thank you. I, I think those are some great ideas, good direction forward. My only hope is that we can pay for that out of our budget, and I know we can. Uh, we've got plenty of money. This administration has plenty of money to be able to fund that. I hope in our next budget year that we would fund that without having to raise, raise rates you know, for the people of this community that just can't afford another dollar you know, every single month raising rates. So I'm sorry that we had to do that actually to the people of this city, raise their rates. So I don't think we had to do that, you know, we just did it. Um, but I think all this could be fully funded, um, you know, through the money, the, the, the massive amount of taxpayer dollars that we're collecting right now and, uh, and probably not spending it very wisely. I do think this is a big priority and I would, I would certainly, you know, support continuing to fund it. Thanks. Councillor Sanchez, then Councillor Grout. Thank you, Mr. President. I have um, two things. Um, one is for Deputy Chief Brown. And the reason I'm asking this question is because it brings me back to my days as, as an APD officer. One of the things that we did as APD officers is we actually issued, whether it was private or public property, we would issue a criminal trespass warning if we just moved the individuals out that warning was documented in the, into the database with a police report so that any officer could reaccess to see if that individual had already been warned and if so, they were issued a citation or arrested. Do you still do that process? Uh, Council President, Council Lewis, or I'm sorry, Sanchez. Absolutely, so that's part of our process when we go out and issue citations is making sure we start off with the criminal trespass notifications. Those criminal trespass notifications are signed off, they're given both to the property owner, the individual who's being CT'd, and then they get entered into on the CAD data system. Thank you, and what's the result if you go back and you encounter the same person twice at the same location? Uh, it depends on the time. Uh, so you have the 72 hour thing, but then we also have, depends if it's a private business, if it's a, they either goes up from a criminal trespass citation to a written citation, um, and if at the end of the day they don't want to leave or if they've been given numerous times and it's a last ditch effort, um, which is our final thing we want to do is they go to jail. Thank you for that. Just wanted to make sure that was on the record and made sure we are still involved in that process. Uh, the last thing question that I had is for um, Director Whelan. And uh, Director, you know me, I, I just want accountability. So I'm just asking to make sure that if you guys keep track of the database or have a database or some sort of way to keep track of where the encampments were, the individuals, um, who's been moved, who hasn't, what was the, what was the dynamics you encountered and in what you did um, with it. That would be really nice to have too. Uh, Council President, Council Sanchez, we do track uh, things through our view work system. It's a work order system. So whenever we dispatch a crew somewhere, we know what staff went out there, what they did, what it cost to clean. And so it is in our system, and it's especially helpful when we do our cleaning liens because we have to assign a cost to that property to lien it. But we also do enter in the, the system the, uh, the encampments that we clean. Uh, we don't use, 
it's very hard for us to get individuals' identification because we really can't ask them for it. But we do take pictures of the encampments, and you know our teams have been working at this for a while, so they're getting pretty well familiar with the, the community out there. And so they do know, you know who the, the, the frequent flyers are and those kind of things, and we try and engage with them as much as possible. And when it comes to um, housing people who are experiencing homelessness, working with Family and Community Services and ACS, that is one of the key things. It's not just going out there, and um, I know the general public has, uh, has the mindset that we just come in and sweep them and move them. But our guys are, are engaging with them, family community services people are engaging with them, ACS is, and we're building that rapport so that that trust can be built up so that we can eventually get them into housing and get them off the street. So it's, it's a lot about communication and it's a lot about being out there in the street. And really, we do track all that stuff, but um, we feel it's a good approach to try and get people the help that they need. Because if it is somebody who's mentally ill or, or experiencing mental illness, we can know to engage ACS right away because we know from our FCS outreach providers, we've already offered them they don't want. ACS can come and continue to support, uh, provide support. So when they do finally decide to go into housing or to go to the West Side Shelter, we've already, they trust ACS and they trust FCS to, to do that. Thank you, Mr. Director. Councilor Grout. It was actually me, Council, um, Mr. President, so thank you. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Um, just a couple of things, Director. Um, if, if you can send us a presentation in, um, without the background in it, because when it's shown on the screen, it's completely black, so it's hard to read. I'd appreciate that. And then maybe by the next meeting, if you could present some type of process flow chart. You know, it seems like it just seems a little convoluted and a little confusing, and I think it would even help the general public, even our analysts, when they're making these calls to know what the process is. Um, I would appreciate that. And then, um, I don't know, this would obviously go to APD, to solid waste, and to transit. I know at the last budget process, um, Councillor Davis had put in some money for 10 additional officers on Central from one end to the other. So I'd like to find out kind of what the status of that is. And then also, in our last budget process, we put in money to clean the bus stops, add, added some additional dollars, so this would be to transit. And then, um, you just mentioned about the additional solid waste workers that was added in the next. So if you can let us know when you're going to start that and what it's going to look like, I would appreciate it. Uh, Council President, uh, Council Pena, we, I will. And Thank we've you. already started that. That's why we went from two crews and 11 employees to four supervisors and 20 employees. So we are bringing them in. And like I said, it's all dependent on getting our equipment. Uh, we're having some issues getting our trucks because the, it's kind of difficult to get computer chips. But we can definitely put together a flow chart and I'll send the Word document over to the policy analyst of this okay. slideshow. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate that. We'll move on now to uh, Councillor Pena. She has a, uh, some officers okay, like I, to recognize. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll keep this brief. I know we've um, spent a lot of time on, on that, but I wanted to call up um, D.C. Brown, uh, Commander Rene, Rene Barasa, Sergeant Jeremy Lujan, Dion, um, I don't want to mispronounce your name, Martin Garcia, Clayton um, Blaylock, and I know uh, Gabe Candelaria couldn't be here. So if you guys can come to the podium, I would appreciate it. And I don't have any kind of formal recognition or, or a, a, pres a presentation, but I wanted to bring you all here because these, um, these young men who are part of the Southwest Area Command, the um, proactive response team, these are um, from District 3 and obviously um, Councilor Sanchez's district as well, have just done an outstanding job with the support of the DC and the commander. You know, um, They're also responsible for um, the upkeep and taking care of and showing the lowrider, but what they've done in our area has been pretty remarkable in terms of some of the recent arrests they've had. And I just wanted to just talk about um, one in particular is that, um, you know, it was in the news just recently about the largest uh, drug arrest in the city of Albuquerque. And these fine men that are all in front of us are part of who took off 20, took out 21 firearms that were recovered, five stolen firearms, five assault rifles, four shotguns, six handguns, two revolvers, two high powered rifles, one short barrel shotgun, one submachine gun, 50 magazines, um, over five rounds of, of 5K 
5,000 rounds were recovered, one stolen motorcycle, over 2,000 fentanyl pills, one bag of meth were recovered, and that's due to these um, fine young men and their leadership at APD, so thank you. And if anybody, uh, Commander, if you wanted to say a few words. Of course, um, City Council President, City Council Pena, it is my honor. Thank you for recognizing the hard work of these men, but every day we know that the men and women of the Arbor Police Department are putting in countless hours to make sure our, our city is safe. Um, I'm honored to be in this position as a commander of the Southwest Air Command uh, due to uh, Chief uh, of Police Medina and Deputy Chief Brown. I was asked to overtake the Southwest Air Command, identified some issues. Um, I put a, a great team together of, of uh, proactive response uh, officers who are very, very experienced and very motivated. I, I'm very honored to have these uh, men working under me. Um, the, the, the situation that you talked about, Councilor, was uh, when I took over uh, the Southwest Air Command, I identified some things that needed to occur. And I wanted to build on the community-oriented uh, policing strategy to strengthen our process with probation and parole. I identified that that process needed to be strengthened because um, it was, to me, it just made no sense that they would have to call, they, the, pro the probation officers, when they went to a house to visit uh, one of the individuals that they were monitoring, they would have to call our emergency communication center to get our backup. Uh, to me, that, that's too much time for anything to happen to those men and women of the Department of Corrections. So I gave a, a direct, um, with Sergeant Luhan, I gave him an order and I said, you know, we need to build this partnership. We need to identify and, and bridge that gap so we can back them up because uh, we don't know what's going on in that home that they just visited. And since that point, um, not only is that one of the incidents, but we've had several incidents where mm -hmm. uh, Sergeant Luhan and the PRT team has responded to back up our, our other partners of the Department of Corrections. And we've been very successful in um, being able to hold people accountable so that way they're not continuing to victimize our community. So I am very honored to be in this position. Councilor Pena, thank you for uh, recognizing the hard work of Sergeant Luhan. Uh, these three officers you see here, one is missing tonight. He yes, couldn't come because okay. he had uh, other obligations with his family. So we, uh, thank you well, very much. Thank you. Thank you again for being here. We really appreciate you. And I just want everybody to know that all you guys know to how to hit the switches on the lowrider as well. So thank you, guys. Take care. <laughs> Thanks, officer. I have a quick comment, too. I just wanted to say thank you as well to um, these young men. Uh, one of the things that's happened many, many times is I actually am on a phone call basis with uh, Sergeant Luhan, and if there's anything that's going on in my area, I can just pick up that phone, and he takes care of it very, very quickly. So I just wanted to, again, say thank you, and thank you to Councilor Pena for recognizing the fine work that these uh, this PRT team is doing in our area. We've noticed a significant change in our area. Thank you. All right, thanks, counselors. We'll move to general public comments. Members of the public can provide live public comment to the council in person or virtually if they have signed up per the instructions published on our agenda. Um, and here are the public comment ground rules. Each participant has one and a half minutes to present. Comments are to be addressed to the counselors only through the council president. Any disruptive conduct will result in removal from the meeting. And uh, with regard to your, your speaking, um, again, there's a one and a half minute limit. The light on the podium will be green for the first uh, uh, minute and, and then uh, the light will turn yellow indicating you have 30 seconds remaining to wrap up your comments. Uh, Mr. Cornelius, please call the name of our first speaker. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Morgan Hobson, followed by Jordan Newlander. I'm here to urge City Council to vote no and reject any attempt to reinstate the doctrine of qualified immunity. It was repealed in New Mexico in 21 because cities like Albuquerque have some of the highest rates of police violations of citizen civil rights through excessive force and often murder, as seen in recent APD murders of Keyshawn Thomas and Colin Azoji, among hundreds more. During our last City Council meeting, we witnessed the deplorable ruling by this council to go against the majority of Albuquerque citizens' wishes to honor democracy and protect human rights. Dan Lewis, you followed a similar pattern 
of actors like Trump and Marjorie Taylor Greene, who ironically use terms like misinformation when referencing opposing views grounded in facts which you are unwilling to contend with. Patterns like this contribute to the distrust in true democracy altogether and give rise to situations such as the January 6th insurrection. We understand that your position is one of exploiting your power in our labor for profit. However, we, the people of Albuquerque, implore you not to continue that pattern here today. You may unhouse and evict us. You may try and keep us from public spaces, including transportation. You may even try to utilize systemic imperialist institutions unjustly to murder us. As a council whose job is to represent the majority of citizens in your districts, you may dishonor that role and promote memorials like qualified immunity, which further protect the people with the most systemic power from any regulations or consequences of infringing upon our civil rights of the people with the least. We are here to demand that you do not, in fact, take that opportunity to further exploit your power. Whether you honor your constituents' wants and best interests or not, we, the majority, will continue to rise to be teachers, caregivers, cleaners, builders, farmers, and medical professionals. Vote no and please enforce democracy. Jordan Newlander, followed by Cynthia Rodriguez. Mr. President, I think I, I, think I heard my name, although I didn't understand exactly what it was in reference to but i'd be glad to if you did mention my name and i'd be glad to i'd be glad to visit with you and talk with you anytime so thank you jordan newlander followed by cynthia rodriguez hello um i just want to uh express a lot of frustration with the memorial six um to reinstate qualified immunity for police officers I'm especially disappointed in Luis Sanchez, um, the counselor for District 1. Um, I'm a teacher in District 1, and two of my students' grandfather was killed by police on a welfare check. It wasn't in District 1, but his entire family lives in District 1. Also in District 1, um, Keyshawn Thomas was recently killed by police officers while napping in his car at a gas station. And I also want to point out that um, and, and, and I also want to point out that the, the son of Margaret, uh, Margaret Smith, who couldn't be here tonight, Dominic Smith, was killed in District 1, right on course, um, and, and none of them have received justice. None of them are apparently receiving any serious internal investigation. And I, and I just really believe that if, if any single person in this room was to kill someone because of their job, they would be tried. And I don't think, um, and they would be personally accountable. And I don't think we should remove that for police officers. Please vote no on the Memorial Six. Cynthia Rodriguez, followed by Kevin Branham. Hi, my name is Cynthia. I'm an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, I'm here tonight because uh, there's a few topics you guys are talking about, specifically about policing. Um, I want to address something right now. You were talking about achievements of arrest that the police have done, but what about the horrific murders that they've also caused the damage to families and communities here? Um, just this year, they burned a 15-year-old alive, and you're talking about bringing back qualified immunity for them. Um, I know there'll be another period to talk about this, and I definitely will be speaking on it. Um, you're also talking about uh, how you can criminalize people in encampments when you just voted no to have a symbolic stance with the people of Albuquerque to end the prohibition on rent control. You're talking about how you can house them. That's how you house people, by making housing affordable, keeping bus fares free so people can get to work, to say, so they can get to their jobs, so that they can pay their bills. Those are things you can do. You shouldn't you should hold APD accountable. You should enforce things like the consent decree and not roll back enforcing it when they murder a 15-year-old child in a fire that they caused. Please vote no to the memorial M226 and keep bus fares free. Kevin Brownham, followed by Ben Imbus. Hello, my name is Kevin Branham. I'm also a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. We demand that you vote no for M226 and reject any attempt to reinstate the doctrine of qualified immunity. We cannot rely on APD to 
control the actions and crimes of police officers. The, poli the people must be able to hold individual cops accountable if they commit a crime. These cops that are often referred to as quote unquote bad apples. We demand an end to all police terror and police brutality. We demand an end to all racist police murder. And we demand that all killer cops be fired, prosecuted, and jailed. The police are no more above the law than any other one of us. When someone is unnecessarily killed by the police, it's not only the individual that is harmed. Entire families are devastated. These are children, grandchildren, siblings, parents, relatives, and not to mention friends all over. Police brutality is an extremely serious issue in Albuquerque and it has not improved since the reforms were forced on APD in 2014. Back in 2014, the average amount of people killed by police was five per year. In 2022 alone, so far, the number has risen to seven. I know so many victims of police brutality and I've heard their stories and seen how they've been affected. And as, as Ben mentioned, uh, Keyshawn Thomas and also uh, Dominic Smith uh, in District 1 are just a, a couple of the names. There's many, many more. If these reforms thanks, were supposed to have an effect on decreasing sir, so the amount. Time is oh. up. The next, next speaker. Ben Imbus, followed by Henry Schoenard. Henry Schoenard, followed by Rebecca Hampton. You're going to be getting something. Yes, I'm Henry. I'm Henry Schoenard. Uh, I wanted something. Yes, could you pass those out to the counselors, please? Okay, sorry. Yeah, my name is Henry Schoenard. You may remember in February um, that you passed a resolution making Albuquerque an age-friendly city, moving it up from age, from senior-friendly to age-friendly. I represent Los Ranchos. And uh, as soon as that happened, um, I worked with the, our uh, Los Ranchos Board of Trustees, and they passed a similar resolution. So that's going to be what, one of the things that you get. Um, they, the, um, what's being passed out here in addition to the resolution by the uh, Los Ranchos Board of Trustees are the talking points for age friendly. Now you may have seen this, but this is the stuff that, we're, that are being passed out. Okay, why am I talking about this? I'm on the advisory council of the Department of Senior Affairs and it's a great organization. I really want, uh, I want to brag about that. Um, and I think this is evidence that Los Ranchos passed a similar resolution and these talking points, I th think, speak to that. Um, and, but in addition, I, I know I'm supposed to be talking only to you, but I hope possibly people can hear me behind, and that is bond uh, issue number one is to support the infrastructure spending of the Department of Senior Affairs. Anybody here in this building that hasn't passed, hasn't uh, voted, please vote tomorrow on, uh, you know, bond issue number one on your ballot. Thank you very much. Rebecca Hampton, followed by Jason Santos. Hi. Um, first, I just want to say it was really ridiculous to stall this meeting about an hour um, just to figure out how to best criminalize homeless people. We really need to solve homelessness with housing, not policing. And the only requirement for accessing housing should be just not having housing. Get rid of the red tape. And it would also help a lot if we could end the prohibition on rent control so people can stop being driven into homelessness as landlords continue to price, price gouge renters. Um, second, I'm here to speak in favor of keeping the zero fare buses as is. Um, I've spent over a decade riding the bus in Albuquerque when I haven't had a car or when my car breaks down. Um, free bus fares has been a game changer for us. Being able to just get on the bus and go where you need to go has helped working class people get and keep jobs, attend medical appointments, see their families and friends and more. Requiring an ID and application is just more red tape that burdens our neighbors who need help the most. When I ride the bus, I see workers from all walks of life, parents, children, students. Many who ride the bus are the most vulnerable in our society, the elderly, disabled, and homeless. 
What bus riders need is guaranteed affordable housing, accessible health care, higher wages, accommodation for disabilities, and other social services. We do not need to be criminalized. I've never felt unsafe while riding the bus. What bus riders do need is vast expansion of bus services, buses that run more frequently late at night, on weekends, and all over the city. Jason Santos, followed by Nicole Tammy. Nicole Tammy, followed by Jennifer Merriman. Jennifer Merriman, followed by Brian Schobel. Good evening. I want to express my support for the Mayor City Housing Initiative. Uh, I direct and am responsible for the office at the University of New Mexico that recruits, admits, onboards, and supports the international student population that comes to New Mexico to study. I have frequent contact with the student population. The housing, so excuse me, the housing shortage and spike in rental rates that we saw during the pandemic have had adverse effects on our international student population. International students don't have some of the same safety nets as many of our domestic counterparts. They don't have relatives in the area. They often don't own vehicles. And so they're compelled to look for housing that is within walking distance to the campus or accessible by public transportation. In 2021, with the closure of student family housing, our international graduate students, particularly those with young families, began to express distress over their ability to find affordable and safe housing. My office scrambled to help these students connect with new housing resources, and we saw the challenges firsthand as families with three children were denied applications for two-bedroom apartments because they were told by prospective landlords that they could not have more than two children in a room. Yet three-bedroom apartments were too expensive for their modest excuse me, graduate salaries and often hard to find. The tragic murders of three South Asian Muslim men this past summer heightened the fear of our international students regarding their safety while commuting to and from campus. The tragic loss of alumnus of Sal Hussein brought to light other less tragic instances of muggings and thefts in the housing communities bordering the UNM campus. Students do not feel comfortable Thank leaving you. their Thank you, your time homes. is up. They're asking permission to study um, uh, online. Madam, almost your finished. time so is up. I'm time asking is expired, authorities please. and housing please. stakeholders to work together to create a safe, affordable housing in that thought process. Thank you. Brian Schobel, followed by Bruce Redford. Excuse me. I'm Jennifer Merriman. I don't know how I got skipped, but I was walking up to the podium. Can I go ahead and speak? Please. OK, thank you. Hello. Okay. Hi, I'm Jennifer Merriman. I'm with the People's Housing Project, and I'm here to say keep the zero bus program. 80% of bus riders love and support zero fares. 60% of riders don't have ADs and requiring them will be the most negative impact on our most vulnerable in our community. To obtain a free bus pass, it burdens our disabled, elderly, and poor neighbors. Unsheltered people get their stuff stolen all the time. Are they, are they to get an ID once, twice, three times a week? This is another cruel attempt to police the poor and not actually keep people safe. Everyone should be able to walk onto the bus for free. Transportation should be a public good. Why not increase the budget? Build safety cages around the hardworking bus drivers. Hire more workers. Why not create a state program that empowers ex-convicts and felons who have already had in their communities or community safe ride leaders, riders and train violent interrupters? Violent interrupters on the bus is a great solution for hardworking people and to keep our bus drivers safe. You all terrify me with every measure that comes down as you add more policing rather than community building. An hour talking about policing the unsheltered. Help the people fight crime through measures that work like ending poverty, guaranteed affordable housing, higher wages, access to health care, mental health care, Meet our basic needs in the solution, not policing. Brian Schobel, followed by Bruce Redford. Council, uh, that, thank you for hearing me. From uh, Councillor Lewis. Hey, Mr. President. Just a moment, sir. I, I, I just, because the, the, the bus fare was uh, discussed, and I'm sure there's a number of other people who might be here tonight, 
um, to, to talk about that and give some comments on it. And so um, I wanted to um, just give a, a little bit, of, a few comments on it just briefly uh, that might uh, interest you for the rest of the meeting. So we do have a, a number of, and I appreciate the, you know, the comments, the calls, the, the emails, um, people expressing a lot of different opinions about it. Um, we, we will be, uh, our intention is to defer this bill tonight for a number of reasons because we do have a, a pretty extensive amendment that we've added and we'll inter introduce that tonight and have a discussion on those, the amendments and the changes, you know, to the bill. Um, and then, uh, and we'll also, you know, probably recommend a 30-day deferral for several reasons because the, the administration has uh, re requested that partly because of the requirements of, uh, with the uh, federal agency when we do any kind of a rate change like that to do a study on it. So we need some time to do that. And then a part of this amendment also is uh, the implementation of the, uh, as far as the, the change in the program um, uh, deferred until the end of the budget year as well, which again, I, I know that's many of you have, have requested that and discussed that. So we're working with the, the, you know, the department in that regard and really want to, to make sure that this is a uh, a bill that's good. That's the intention of the, the sponsors of this bill, is recognizing uh, some of the challenges and, and, uh, and, and seeing if we can come up with some ways to be able to improve uh, our, our transit system in that way. And really to ensure, you know, for the future, uh, that there are, um, is the ability to be able to, um, to, be able to ride the bus for, for free uh, for those that need to and want to. And so, uh, so that's our intention, and I, I think that's what this bill reflects. Uh, but, Mr. President, I just want to take a moment just to, uh, because I know, again, many of you are here to talk about that tonight. We will defer that bill tonight, but we'll discuss this, uh, this amendment um, tonight as well. So thank you, sir. I, I, I appreciate your patience. So um, I wanted to talk about that bill. <laughs> and so the biggest thing is uh, I'm a special education teacher for the district. I support other teachers across the whole district in all learning zones. And transportation is the number one concern for the individuals that I'm working with. If it's paratransit or if it's the fixed bus route, it is a crucial necessity of life. And right now, I, I, I mean, the bill is evolving, and I know you guys are doing additions and amendments and things of that nature, but some of the concerns me is putting any kind of extra barrier to be able to just walk onto a bus and use it as freely as walking down the street. Right now, I don't quite agree with the idea of trying to have some kind of regulation where there has to be an ID. I have many students right now who I have seen across the district who just physically cannot get an ID. If it's the protocols involved in getting that ID, if it's the financial components of getting that ID, ultimately any barrier in regards to transportation I am opposed to. And right now, it feels like this is just going to be another bureaucracy of a step that my students are going to have to go through to be able to get on a bus and use it as freely as walking down the street. So please keep the zero fares, but also keep in mind, make it as accessible as possible without any hindrance of ID or anything, anything else like that. Thank you so much. I just want to add to that. I really appreciate Councillor Lewis's comments, and I just want to add to that. You know, I've mentioned this before. Uh, this has been very important to us to make sure that we kind of do this right without ignoring some of the security concerns that we've um, we've learned about. So, um, this gentleman's talking about people who um, who ride the bus who have disabilities. So, prior to, and um, it's actually an initiative that I introduced uh, at the urging of Councillor former Councillor Senna. Um, at the last budget cycle. So I'm really proud that we did the, the zero fares and with the support of the rest of this council. Um, but, you know, prior to that, even now, if you want to ride the sun van, because I do have a family member who's developmentally delayed, and I have two other members who are in wheelchairs that are family members, um, they have to fill out an application to ride the sun van. So that's current, right? So um, when we're talking about these barriers, those are still barriers that are, that are, that are in place. So as we're working and navigating through this, um, as uh, Councillor Lewis stated, you know, we're making some changes to break down as many barriers as possible. So thank you. Bruce Redford, followed by Jose Enriquez. 
Good evening. My name is Bruce Redford, and I'm representing two boards, the board of the Huning Highland Neighborhood Association and the board of the East Downtown Business Association. Both boards are deeply concerned by the lamentable condition of the underpass that takes Central Avenue underneath the railroad tracks. As of 10 days ago, there were no lights in this underpass. It was pitch black, and the pavement was indescribably filthy. I know there have been many attempts to enliven this particular space, to make it not only safe but attractive. These have clearly failed, given the current condition of the underpass. This is of concern to our two neighborhood associations, not only because it affects the quality of life for people who live in the neighborhood, but because it impairs the image of the city of Albuquerque for the increasingly prosperous east downtown area. We now have a new Hilton at the corner of Broadway and Central. Anyone staying at that Hilton as a visitor who wants to walk into Central Albu Albu Albuquerque is going to find herself or himself running the gauntlet of this terrifying and filthy space. So we have two recommendations at the very least. The first is the installation immediately of 24-hour high-intensity lights in the underpass in places that cannot easily be vandalized. And the second recommendation is to increase the sanitation, perhaps to wash the pavements at least several times a week. We have other ideas as well, but my time is up, and I would welcome a further conversation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Redford. Uh, I'm assuming uh, that you and others have, have reported the lighting. I, I've definitely heard about it, and we've passed along the question, but I wanted to ask our DMD director and or uh, Mr. Ryle to, to speak to uh, what the uh, plan is to get the lights back on there. We did a big, expensive project for the lights there, and uh, I, would, I would wonder whether it's even still under warranty. And then we'll... Uh, have Director Whelan speak to the cleanliness of the property. So. Mr. President. Is it on? Uh, Mr. President, so um, I got the email today and we've addressed the situation. So Mr. Redford and Mr. Trujillo both raised the issue with us. So there are actually three departments that are somewhat responsible for the underpass. And Director Whelan will talk a little bit about the cleanliness. The lights in the underpass have been vandalized I believe now at least twice in the last four months or so. We're working with our contractor now, which is Dalkia, to actually look at a way of installing lights that have a cage or something around them that they're not hit with a broomstick or a rock stone at them, but it's become a, an increasingly large problem for us. So by the end of the week, uh, Mr. Uh, Keefe from Dalkia has a proposal to us that will somehow stabilize those lights better than what they are now. We're also looking at adding additional lights within the tunnel and we're also looking at increasing the density of the light itself so that it's much brighter. And then the other thing we're talking about, and uh, it, it's something that uh, has been used in other parts of the city, is to maybe have some sort of uh, music within the, the tunnel that would discourage individuals from sleeping there at night. So we're aware of the problem. Uh, we're addressing it as quickly as we can, but we know we have a problem with the lighting. And uh, Director Whelan is here to talk a little bit about the cleanliness, and then I know Commander Wheeler is also here to talk about APD patrols within the tunnel itself. And, and Director Monsoya, I, I mean, as, as I said, uh, I personally have been working on this, uh, <laughs> this challenge for years now. Um, we had two, not one, but two separate consultants. I don't know why we had to have two separate design consultants on this to study it and say, oh, yes, indeed, one, one of them was paid to say, yes, indeed, there's a problem, and the next one was paid in theory to design it uh, and with with my repeatedly saying you know what about hardening of this system where it it will be vandal proof and that that had to be a paramount issue with the design so i wonder if the designers of this or the installers of it shouldn't be held accountable as as to the idea that that it apparently is is not vandal proof um, but uh, but obviously, it's an unacceptable, unacceptable situation. You know, this is just on my own, spending my own, our own district to discretionary funds. You know that that we've we've gotten to this point, and, and we're still where we were. It's really disappointing. 
but I'd like to hear from Director Whelan about the, the uh, cleaning schedule of the, of the uh, underpass. Uh, Council President, yeah, so every morning we start downtown area to empty the trash cans and uh, one of our litter crews does go through those and pick up any debris that they may see or anything that's within those. Um, and then they try and make it back through towards the end of the day, but their days end around 2, 2.30 because they come in at 6.30. So what we're planning on doing is we have our Duke City ambassadors previously block by block that are in the downtown area, and we're currently in, in negotiations with them right now to add those two st that stretch to what they're already doing because it's not currently included in the contract. So once we can get them to agree to that, um, then we'll have them going through there throughout the day as well. So not only will our crew hit it once in the morning and then once in the afternoon, but then block by block, or I'm sorry, Duke City ambassadors will go through periodically through the day all the way up to Broadway where that uh, Hilton Garden is. So we think with that and with uh, better lighting, it will help because um, it is kind of difficult, especially early in the morning when it's dark to see certain things, but we will increase our patrols through there with our Duke City ambassadors. Yeah, obviously it must be hard to clean if it's if it's not lit. But uh, but but secondly, just again talking about set aside from District Two, we used to set aside from District Two to buy a sidewalk cleaner cleaning equipment. Is that still operational, and is that what's being used? Uh, Council President Benton, yes, we do go through and we sweep it, power wash it. Uh, we try and do it at least once a week, or sometimes twice a week, just depending on availability. But um, that does happen. And, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Rell and I have talked about this repeatedly in, in previous uh, CAOs that, that uh, um, and, and, and we've taken a look at, at, at designing something that is not, that does not require pedestrians to go through that tunnel, including expanding the rail runner platform and things of that nature that would would seem to be a possibility. I just ask quickly, uh, Mr. Rell, if he has any comments on that. Um, Mr. President, um, just for your information, and I know that uh, this is a, an evolving process, but the, um, the rail trail project does uh, inc incorporate a uh, pedestrian at-grade crossing there at Central. Uh, it would be our goal because we all um, have experienced the same issues that we're talking about here about how difficult it is to keep that that underpass clean, and um, and the fact that that uh, underpass has always been an issue that separates the two uh, the areas of downtown. Um, so the new uh, rail trail project will have an at grade crossing, and it may be an opportunity as we go through the design to consider whether or not we limit or completely close pedestrian access under the underpass and just leave it for automobiles. And um, it'll have steps and ADA accommodations so that as people can walk from both sides of the track and, uh, and ultimately create a better pedestrian access. Uh, so that is part of the consideration there as, as the design moves forward with the, uh, with the rail trail. And, and in the past, Mr. Ryle, uh, uh, discussions having to do with the railroad uh, or the Department of Transportation of the state and also the Federal Railway Administration that their criteria, is that still seen as an obstacle for us to, to make this crossing using the, the rail trail? Mr. President, um, I think one of the opportunities that we have is when the state acquired the, the track uh, to uh, build the rail runner, the BNSF, which was the private railroad carrier, that owned the corridor who was really concerned about this whole issue of aggregate crossings because of the length of their trains, really abandoned the corridor from day-to-day uh, -day operations. They still do some switching in some areas of the city. But now with the state owning the, the, the corridor, I've had conversations with the Secretary of Transportation. They are very much supportive of, of, uh, of another uh, aggregate crossing there just like the one at Marquette that just was recently built. And we know that the FRA will require the, uh, the uh, required, if you will, infrastructure to ensure that people are safe. But I am very hopeful that, um, that the crossing itself will not impede either Amtrak or the BNSF or the rail runner because of the way the, the crossing is designed and where the stations for rail runner and Amtrak are located on that corridor. 
So I do think we have a much better opportunity to get through that, this process this time than maybe it was before. All right. Th thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you, Director Montoya and Director Whelan. If you would, uh, you know, keep uh, my office apprised of, of, of progress on both fronts, I would like to be able to, to convey that to the neighborhood. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Redford for coming down and speaking. Uh, uh, we've got a long list of, of speakers tonight, but, but happy to have you reach out to our office anytime. Jose Enriquez, followed by Joel Gallegos. I'm Jose Enriquez, an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation, a Union Carpenter and Renter in District 2. I'm urging the council to vote no on Council Bill 02247, which will amend the free bus fare program. This is a blatant attack on Albuquerque's poor and working class, which are the majority of residents in the city that you should be fighting for. Voting for the bill means that you are standing against 80% of ABQ ride users who support the free bus fare program making bus riders, many of whom who don't have a driver's license, to show this documentation to be able to qualify for the fee bus program is a clear attack. Using the bus system is already difficult due to inconsistent schedules and bus arrivals. We don't need to add more hurdles for people to use city buses. Public transportation is a public good and it should be expanded to all with no exceptions. There seems to be a concern over crime in the bus system, and this can be done by ending poverty by doing things like providing affordable housing, health care, and mental health services, and not by policing poor people. I encourage the council to stand with the majority of Albuquerque's residents, and they can do this by voting no for Council Bill 02247. Joel Gallegos, followed by Roger Culp. My name is Roger Culp. I'm also a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. I was going to speak on the bus fares, but I think I will wait on that until I see what uh, you decide. But I was going to talk about, uh, I want to urge you to vote no on the memorial for, to approve qualified immunity. Between 2014 and 2022, Albuquerque was overseen by the Department of Justice. It's ruled that Albuquerque had an inordinate number of police killings. I would like to see not only the, the, uh, vote, the uh, council vote no on qualified immunity, I would like to see that all police be held criminally accountable for shootings where, especially where somebody is unarmed, there is somebody is having a mental health crisis, or with, involving the killing of a, of a minor child. Also, I do think that body cam footage from police shootings ought to be released to the public within, say, 48 hours ma maximum, so the public can decide what, what exactly what happened. And I, would, I, I await your decision on uh, the bus fare. I hope you do decide to make the bus fares free because, as you may know, there are dozens of cities that are smaller than Albuquerque and have smaller budgets in Albuquerque, all over the country that have free bus fares. Gregory Sherman, followed by Tendius Numiski. Okay, I want to talk about uh, two problems uh, as I see it. Uh, one happened to me last Thursday uh, when I was taking the uh, bus to work. Um, took the, uh, uh, looks like uh, the ART bus to uh, the ATC. Uh, before it uh, got on the next bus, which would have been the 16 uh, Broadway bus, scheduled to leave at 7.09. It never showed up. Called 311. They had no explanation. I have no idea why it didn't show up. I get that they're short on, on bus drivers, and they don't always, not always able to make uh, these here, but if, if there's not going to be a bus at a particular time, at least have the courtesy to put a sign saying that that route is canceled. The other one uh, concerns uh, 
what everybody's been talking about here regarding the um, uh, the free bus pair uh, thing. Um, the way I see it, um, I think that uh, Councillor Lewis's concerns are very valid, and they they need to be dealt with. But this is not the way to do not the way to do it. I believe that they can be dealt with with those 10 officers that uh, uh, Councillor Davis uh, requested there. Thank you, sir. Am I done? Okay. All right. Tadeusz Numitski, followed by Kyle Tapaha. Thank you. My name is Ted Niemiski. <clears throat> well, Council Dan Lewis, he was looking uh, during the meeting with the director. Uh, he was looking for for solution. Well, here is El Presidente based on uh, sweeping once or once or or every two weeks sidewalk. That's a solution. Now, Davis, I ask him in my neighborhood where Wisconsin ending from central north ending in the alley. He never responded, nothing was done, neither his policymaker, neither director of city council ever called me back. So anyway. Well, Council, then Lewis, do you want to take it a business from big, big cow milking city, milking city, which is St. Martin? Do you want to put them in our business? They are mega already. They are the biggest one. What they done it? They just building millions of dollars every year. Tens of millions every day being appropriate. Thank you. Kyle Tapaha, followed by Kristen Forgy on Zoom. Good, ev good evening, uh, honorable council persons. Uh, my name is Kyle Tapa. I am a Navajo. I'm Native American, um, US Navy veteran, and I am a recent homeowner. I wanted to talk on the housing uh, situation. So I am also on the Commission on American Indian Alaska Native Affairs with the city. Uh, so we make recommendations to the mayor and I wanted to urge city council support for uh, the mayor's housing initiative as well as support for Gateway Center. Um, I've been uh, in uh, talking with our community and these are uh, good options for, for pathways to home ownership. Um, I also was a homeless veteran as well too. So I utilize uh, uh, a nonprofit here in town, and it, it did help me. Um, not not only with um, with getting me off the street, but with learning how to uh, navigate urban city as as an indigenous person. So I now I know what equity in a house is. I know I know uh, how to navigate these systems, and now my it is my honor to help other indigenous people do the same thing. So uh, I, I do want to thank the city council um, uh, for all the support that he have given to the Native American community, but there is still more work that needs to be done and I am available for, for um, more, more conversations to, to improve our community, my community now of Albuquerque. So I, thank you. Thank you for coming to speak, sir. And it, it, we, we saw the statistics that, that uh, disproportionate numbers of, of the folks living on the street are Native American, and um, that's that that's a shame given where we live. But uh, but really appreciate you coming to speak and and telling your story. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council. Kristen Forgy, followed by Angelina Crowley.
Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Great. Uh, what other city requires government issued ID to ride the bus? None. I researched and I was not able to find one single U.S. city that implements this ridiculous racist and classist concept. Public transit gives folks access to laundry facilities, grocery stores, and hey, call me crazy, a nice day at the park. When you already have limited resources, public transit is a lifeline. Having to use an ID to ride is ludicrous. I have personally lost my ID multiple times and it isn't an overnight fix. What is a woman supposed to do if the bus is how she gets to and from work? What if her shift ends after it gets dark? Should she walk home alone in the dark simply because she lost her ID and is waiting on a new one? Again, ludicrous. The abysmal Albuquerque public transit should forever be free to assist the community's most vulnerable citizens. If the council is scared to take the bus, then I suggest they develop relationships with citizens who ride it regularly. I firmly encourage the council members to leave their privilege at the door and connect with their community to, who take public transit regularly and not their peers who we know do not take public transit. What we should be focusing on is expanding public transit hours and routes, not allowing a few out of touch gatekeepers in power the ability to deem who is worthy of riding based on access to resources. Shame on whoever rode the bus one time and came up with this classist, racist and ridiculous concept. And to the counselors presenting this motion, trust me, your intention is very clear. Angelina Crowley, followed by Peter Kalitsis. Uh, yeah, I'm Angelina. I'm the organizer with the People's Housing Project. Uh, Y'all have definitely seen me here before. Um, basically, I want to state that 61% of passengers don't possess a valid driver's license. This was found on a weekday from the onboard surveys on ABQ Ride. Um, also, uh, with my interactions with the homeless community, um, most of them aren't able to keep an ID if they are able to obtain it and they work hard with their social work or whatever, if they are by some miracle able to obtain an ID, then they're going to lose it because they're out in the streets and homeless and they're susceptible to all this violence. And just like um, any person in the community, homeless are not trying to better themselves, trying to get to work, um, do whatever they need to do. This transportation should not be a barrier. It's disgusting to put this up and uh, whether this is like tabled now, um, the free bus fares and uh, the transportation on the bus rides without barriers need to continue and the transportation in the city needs to be expanded. Um, we need more buses, not just two buses running on Central, like we need buses that actually run for people and show up for people. And uh, yeah, that's all I have to say, thank you. Peter Kalitsis, followed by Sandra Perea. Uh, President Benton and counselors, speaking for Parkland Hills Neighborhood Association, as part of the three neighborhood associations appealing the gateway conditional use permit, we request that you examine and act upon our submitted request to complete the IDL conditional use appeals process. We recognize the need for overnight shelters and request the completion of the IDO appeal process so that the Gateway Overnight Shelter can legally open. Uh, we look forward to your response. Thank you. Sandra Perea, followed by Rachel Baca. Council President Benton and counselors. My name is Sandra Perea, and I'm the president of Elder Homestead, one of the three neighborhood associations appealing the gateway conditional use permit. And we request that you examine our request for completion of the IDO appeal process. You may wonder why we have not spoken to you individually after the planning director and Mr. Melendres told us that the appeal process is complete. We have examined the IDO in conjunction with the Lujos decision, and we see error in their interpretation. Thus, we do not want to jeopardize a potential quasi-judicial hearing when you, the city council, holds the appeal review and decision phase of the IDO appeal process. 
please review and act on our submitted request so that the gateway overnight shelter can open with a legally completed conditional use permit. Thank you. Rachel Baca, followed by Rosemary Blanchard. President Benton and council members, my comment is a follow-up to my September 19th request for correction of a denial of IDO procedure for city council appeal review and decision for the gateway conditional use permit. This is to correct an error in the completion of the IDO process that will prevent the gateway overnight shelter from legally opening under the current projected plan to partially open in December. Per IDO 6-2, as well as the land use hearing officer, Stephen Chavez's written recommendation where he said, I am cognizant that aside from the remand itself, everything that is decided in this appeal at this level is a recommendation to the city council. Thus, when the ZHE decides the narrow issue on remand, all the issues and findings herein, including the remand issues, can be finally decided by the city council. But all issues, including the remand issues, are preserved for the city council. After the Luho hearing and recommendation, the appeal was supposed to be reviewed or heard by the city council for a final determination. This has not occurred. And in choosing a course of inaction, the council is denying due process to the affected neighbors. Per Luho's February 18th recommendation to the city council, when the ZHE decides a narrow issue, including the remand issues, then they can finally be decided by the city council. The LUHO instructions and the final decision by the city council have not occurred. Therefore, the IDO appeal Thank process you. Your time is time complete. Has expired. Rosemary Blanchard. Thank you, President uh, Benton and members of the council. Uh, my name is Rosemary Blanchard. I live in District 2, and I just wanted to comment on two issues that are on your agenda and one that is not and should be. You have recognized uh, that November of 2022 is Homeless Youth Awareness Month. I would encourage you to take that awareness and put it to practical use to actually help homeless youth and other homeless adults who uh, find themselves needing services in our city and in unable to uh, unable to seek them. I'm sorry, my phone went off. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry that happened. And uh, anyhow, didn't know my phone was going to go off in my ear. But anyway, uh, you have uh, a SOS op operators permit that you're uh, looking at. And I urge you to make sure that you don't use it in ways that discourage concerned people from applying to operate safe outdoor spaces. And uh, I also would ask how the requirement that the safe outdoor space operator not permit persons with felony assault and battery convictions, which is a requirement I can understand, but what process would a person have to go through to have a prior conviction sufficiently cleared that they would not make them ineligible to uh, use an SOS? Or what would the operator have to do? Or would this be a reason to uh, find the operator in violation of something? Thank you. Your time is up. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes general public comment. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Councilor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I was just informed that uh, there's a fire going on at UNM, a large structure fire, and I just want to make sure that uh, the firefighters um, are in our prayers, making sure we that no one gets hurt and everyone is safe uh, in reference to that. Apparently, it's a very large structure fire, and uh, we'll be reaching out to, uh, to the firefighters to see um, how everything went down, and hopefully everything was was safe, and uh, they have a successful successful conclusion there. I hate to see large structure fires um, in our city, so no, they're very very dangerous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to questions for the administration. Councilors, any questions for the administration? Councilor Lewis. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Rell, I, I just uh, wondering about this. Um, uh, when the uh, the current president was in town this week, did the, the city acquire any expenses to do that visit? Um, Mr. President, um, I'm not sure what the background noise is, but it's really hard to hear the question. You mind repeating that, Councillor Lewis? So just if uh, the city of Albuquerque acquired any, any expenses uh, due to um, any time that was relayed due to the president's visit this week? Uh, Mr. President and uh, Councillor Lewis, um, the, uh, the facility that was utilized was rented by the organizing uh, group. They paid the full cost of, of utilizing the community center. They also uh, paid a security fee for any damage that might be caused by a large event of that nature. Uh, so they were fully, uh, the city was fully compensated for that. One of the events happened at CNM, um, and so that was organized by, a, by uh, a different group of folks, so I don't know what that uh, compensation might have been for that portion of the visit. And then the, uh, the, the uh, motorcade, if you will, and the police protection that always occurs whenever the president visits, regardless of party, was an uh, expense that was uh, incurred by the city, as we have for all events uh, that occur whenever the president, uh, to keep the president. We had police state. coverage of the event, and we acquired some expenses due to that. I'm sorry? We had police coverage uh, during the event. APD, we, we covered that event. There yes, was we some, did. There were some hours that APD mm -hmm. you know, spent during that time. That's correct. We covered those expenses as part of our city's protection of. Do we know about how much? Were there, were there barricades put up at all? Did APD in that process put up barricades? Uh, Mr. President, uh, Councillor Lewis, uh, the barricades, at the, again, at the facility itself where the event was held was paid for through the security deposit that was... Um, Who did the security deposit go to? It came to the city of Albuquerque as part How of the How much was that? The, I, I don't have the number off the top of my head. I believe it was close to $1,000 for the entire event, but I can get that number for but you. But that wouldn't have covered the, just the police officer's time and... With the barricade, with the uh, motorcade, and then the time that there was the event the whole, the whole day? Mr. President and Councilor Lewis, uh, no, that would just cover the use of the facility and the premises and any additional expenses that were beyond the normal course of, of running that facility. So, and I, uh, are there in, in ten, any intentions on invoicing the, the President's campaign on those expenses? Uh, Mr. President, uh, the, uh, the party that uh, Again, lease the facility was um, was uh, billed for that for that use. But they didn't. But pay the for protection. The, uh, they didn't pay for the police hours. I mean, we have a pretty significant amount of police hours. You're saying. And Mr. President and Councillor Lewis, now they the police hours as always are expenses that are incurred by any city whenever you have a presidential visit to ensure the safety of the president. But they they weren't uh, just incurred, and we we billed the, the the previous president for those though, correct? Mr. President. Um, we billed uh, a, the previous uh, president, if you will, for the use of the facility downtown and the expenses related to that, which were never yeah, paid, also, but those were, those were billed as well. also listed police coverage, so the, the barricades that were put up, as well as the, you know, the police coverage and the use of APD's time, you billed them for that as well, correct? We billed them for the overnight stay in the downtown area. That is correct. Uh, there but was, it was no. It was, I mean, whether it was overnight or not, there was hours that were used for the motorcade in the same way. So I, I just, I'm trying to see if there's any similarity to this. I mean, what's, what's the difference? Mr. I President. I think there are some differences, but it seems like there's uh, some very specific, you know, similarities as well. I mean, the same things, the same services that APD provided for the current president provided the same services for the previous president. So I'm, I'm wondering why, I don't care if we, we invoice them or not, to be honest. What I care about is just, just the hypocrisy, it seems like, when we, when we, we treat it differently like that, so. Mr. Rowell, if I could, was, was it, because as I recall, wasn't there some issue with the previous president where he was asked not to headquartered downtown because his events were not downtown yet he did and we were forced uh, the city was forced to uh, apparently evacuate city hall because of the president presence of president trump at that time that's what i recall that he was being billed for as 
that is that not correct? Well, there was some differences. Uh, well, I'm president. asking, uh, I'm asking uh, yeah. Mr. Rao, Councilor. Uh, Councilor, uh, Mr. President, Councilor, I believe that those were the expenses that the that the uh, previous administration had been billed for was for the inconvenience of or the not the inconvenience I should say that for the uh, closing down of downtown area. Uh, as part of another event that was being held in another part of the city. And that was the previous administration? That's right. Okay, thank you. Well, Mr. President, I mean, my question has to do with were there, were there expenses acquired you know, by this last presidential visit, which was a campaign visit, because the campaign, I mean, the Democrat National Convention actually paid for the community center. So it wasn't a presidential visit. It was a campaign visit. Otherwise, the, the president would have, you know, the White House would have paid for the community center, too. Uh, but the, the, the DNC uh, paid for the uh, community center. Um, so were there other expenses acquired? I mean, how much, how much money did, we, did APD spend if we were to total up all those hours? How many police officers? Uh, what would be the total salary uh, that we would have to spend? On? And why aren't we invoicing them for it? Mr. President and, and Councilor Lewis, uh, it's my understanding that the visit to Albuquerque was an official visit to CNM to talk and why about why did the DNC pay for the Would you like me to finish the conversation? Go ahead. <laughs> and and that was the official visit from the president. The portion that was uh, a if you will the visit to the community center was paid for by uh, the, the the organizing group that paid for the use of the city facility and the ancillary costs associated with the use of that facility. The movement of the president to the city of Albuquerque has always been and will continue to be a cost that is borne by the local uh, police departments to ensure the safety of the commander in chief, the president of the United States. And no, we did not bill him for the portion that was uh, required to move with the president safely to the community. You all spend a lot of time, a lot of time and energy totaling up all those invoices and everything we want to reimburse the the former president, and again, I don't care if you invoice you know, Biden's campaign or not, or, or what you do with the, the previous campaign, but definitely, uh, you know, you know, definitely a, you know, a different standard there. And uh, you know, at a time when you know, this administration is paying $60,000 for a book to be written about the mayor, a political book to be written about the mayor, that taxpayers spent $60,000 on, um, you know, talking about, I mean, the whole first part of that book talks about you know, the writers, you know, tucking her kids in bed at night, um, you know, talking about what, you know, trying to explain to her kids why they, why they had to wear masks. Um, and same with the mayor, when the mayor tucked his kids in bed. To, to, you know, what the book doesn't talk about all the, all the people around the city that had to tuck their kids in bed at night and explain to them, you know, why their, their business shut down that day, you know. So, I mean, like 40 pictures in this book of the mayor and his family, and, and we could justify taxpayer dollars on that. And then, Again, you know, we, I could talk about that. We could talk about uh, no the, the just the outrageous audience. amount of unclassified positions that we have. Uh, but what really, what it's all about is just the, you know, it's a, you know, unbelievable amount of just uh, um, we care about these expenses, but we could care less about taxpayer dollars on a book or, you know, on hiring unclassified employees without job descriptions or any kind of a process or anything like that. And so. Um, I think people see that, you know, which is one of the reasons why I think that, uh, um, you know, mayor's ratings aren't too favorable right now. So. Other questions, counselors, for the administration? Councilor Sanchez. Yes, I have a question for uh, Mr. Al. Um, Mr. Al, since the chief, police chief's not here, I'll ask you the question. Um, when um, I started the police department in 1989, and that's the date they graduated. I think it was October 10th of 89, if I can remember correctly. And when I started that day um, with the Albuquerque Police Department, um, just so happens that they researched that, that year that I started. And um, the police association president, Sean Willoughby, announced at that time, or researched that in 1989, he found out that APD had 899 sworn officers, and of that, 640 of them were assigned to three area commands. Um, today, I received a bid list from, uh, from, from the union or from someone who sent me the bid list, 
today. And what they identified is that we only have 297 officers um, assigned to the bid plus 29 um, P2Cs, which are not fully vested officers yet. They still need training. They're still under probation. So me having experience with APD, dealing with what happens at the bid is every bid has an inflated number, um, which does not include promotions, does not include individuals who have been already hired in other positions. So this is going to diminish down to um, be under 300 um, when the officers or when our uh, police department is done with this bid process. And the question that I have is if, what is failure if this isn't? Do we go all the way down to 200 officers? Do we end up at 100 and officers? What's, what's failure look like to this administration? Because when I look back and see 640 officers when I started in 1989, and you do the math, how many years ago was it? What are we doing to adjust this situation and fix it? Um, we're throwing money at them. We already know that. We're doing everything we can with the retention bonuses. We know that. But there's got to be another reason why these officers are still not taking the money and staying. And we, as the citizens of Albuquerque, city council funds it, need to know what is going on with the catastrophic failure at APD. Mr. President, um, if you might, uh, uh, Chief Medina is on, um, on the line, I believe, and he would love to respond to your question. Chief, can you hear us? Council President Minton, uh, Councilor Sanchez, you know, policing has changed quite a bit since 1989. In 1995, when I entered the Albuquerque Police Department, there was no such thing as CIT, that's Crisis Intervention Officers. Uh, we created a crisis intervention team. That crisis intervention team takes up approximately about 20 to 25 officers right now. Those 25 officers used to be part of Field Services Bureau. Uh, when you look at homicide units, back then, when I came on in 1995, homicide was approximately eight detectives. We now have 16 detectives in the homicide unit. Uh, those six, those uh, additional detectives of eight plus the supervisors involved in it came from Field Services Bureau. When I became a sergeant in 2003, uh, I had a squad of 14 officers. Right now that span would require two sergeants rather than one. Uh, that eight to one ratio uh, affects the entire department. And where we used to have large squads where one sergeant oversaw them, now we have several. Uh, back then we had about five, I think we'd both agree about internal affairs individuals. Right now we have about 20. All these additional bodies have to come from somewhere. And unfortunately the field takes the biggest hit uh, from them all. Uh, this is something that the Albuquerque Police Department alone is not uh, failing at. This is something that nationwide uh, we're seeing a struggle with agencies being able to keep up uh, re recruiting and retaining the amount of officers they need. Uh, another thing that's occurred since the beginning of this settlement agreement, uh, the, the amount of time that our officers spend on a priority one has doubled, a uh, little more than doubled. Priority twos doubled. Uh, back in the time when you and I were both field officers, Councilor Sanchez, we uh, would respond to a call with an individual armed with a knife, two officers. Right now under our settlement agreement, uh, you have an officer that's lethal, you have an officer less lethal, you have a CIT officer, and you have a field sergeant. That doubles the amount of officers necessary to go. So there's a lot of different things that are straining the resources at the Albuquerque Police Department. 
it's not just the amount of officers that we've lost from the field, uh, but it's also the amount of officers that we have to dedicate to each and every call and various units such as homicide. One of the things that I, I really also want to point out is <clears throat> the fact that we are doing things to overcome this. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the positions at Albuquerque Police Department. Some of them unclassified. 25 of those unclassified positions is an addition of per public service aides, where we're trying to increase the ranks of public service aides to make sure that we have officers who, people who could respond to other types of calls. We've increased the number of uh, uh, crime scene specialists. That was something that we didn't have in, in uh, 1995 or 1989. Uh, we've also increased the number of civilians that are doing use of force investigations, uh, which is something we didn't have in the past, but we're adding civilians onto it. Uh, we've added a real-time crime center, which is getting more information to our field officers. So there's a variety of ways that we're trying to balance uh, the needs one little place that sometimes people don't think about where we're trying to Mr. President, uh, overcome it. Chief is, uh, Medina, we've already heard part. these over and over for you for the last 10 months. So we've been listening to, to this for 10 months already. Um, my guy asked the CAO, what is considered failure? We're talking about the field services officers, the officers who respond to calls for service that go to your house, that go to my house, that go to the counselor's house, everybody in city council and everybody listening. Those are the officers that we need on the street. That's where it's taking the biggest hit. That's where we need the most amount of officers. It would make sense to me that you would redirect the officers where they're needed most. The whole time that I've been a police officer and the whole, and this will never change, the backbone of the police department is field services. Build services is where we need the officers to respond to the citizens of Albuquerque. The CIT officers, I can go on, I can have, tell you stories about the CIT officers not handling the calls that, that they're supposed to handle. I can go on about the uh, backlog in calls for service that happened every single day. I could go on about the individuals who are dealing with, with uh, 911 calls, who call police and have, needing an emergency and the officer, there's not enough officers to show up. Those are the things that we need answers to. We, we, we are the highest in homicides ever, ever in the history of Albuquerque. And I can say, how many homicides are we at now? 110, 111. With that stat, somebody needs to open their eyes and say, enough is enough. Something needs to change. Something needs to change. And until we get some sort of solid change, I don't think that any of us even here in here want to hear the same excuses over and over and over again. And that's what I've been hearing for 10 months. Something by now should have been done. All right, any other questions for the administration? Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, uh, Director Whalen had given us uh, times that the 311 lines were open, and I'm wondering if 242 COPS has time frames where they are answering calls or if it's 24 hours a day. Mr. President, um, I'm not sure if, if uh, Chief Medina has um, gone off the line. I would, yeah, it would have been a great question to ask him. Is he back? Chief? Yes. Council uh, President uh, Benton, Councilor Bazan, can you repeat your question again? I couldn't hear it. Sure. Mr. President, Chief Medina, is 242 COPS open uh, 24 hours or in answering calls for 24 hours a day, or is it do, do they close from time to time? No. Uh, 242 COPS is always open. 911 is always open. Uh, Deputy Chief Griego can be let into the meeting, and he could give you an update if you need an update on it. But they have had some success uh, in 242 COPS, and there are still outliers of calls that uh, hold for an extended period of time, but he does have a good update on uh, 242 COPS. Thank you, Chief. And then uh, just real quick about the 311 hours. I'm assuming it's, it's the intention to have that become 24-7 someday, maybe, or no? Mr. President and, and Councilor Bassan, um, let me visit with the uh, with Mr. Osterloh, who manages that organization. 
I know that on weekends, the call volumes are not the same as they are during the week, and it's a way to manage resources and also to get information out to folks, but uh, we'll get back with you with uh, more solid answers. Sure, thank you so much. And then just the, the impetus behind this is that I did have a constituent inform me that they called 242 COPS and it, it was not open. Maybe I misunderstood it or maybe they meant to dial, they dialed 311 and they, I don't know where and how the confusion was, but just so that I just wanted to make sure that the public is clear, that we're clear, um, that 242 COPS and 911 answered 24 seven, even if there might be a little delay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bassant. Or Councillor Grout, excuse me. Mr. President, thank you. I have a couple of questions for Director Pierce. Hi, Director. Um, I have a few questions about the city's purchase on the Sure Stay Hotel at Hotel Circle. Can you please tell me the um, plan for that property? and the status of the purchase. Yes, um, Councillor Benton and Councillor Grout. Um, right now, we are in the process of negotiating a purchase agreement with that owner. Okay, and then what are the plans for that property exactly? Well, again, we're right now in the process of, of negotiating that purchase, um, but the idea is that would become affordable housing. And I'm hearing a lot of concerns from our constituents. Um, are you planning a community meeting? And if so, when? Councilor Benton and, and um, Councilor Grout, yes, we would like to have a community meeting broadly about the strategy about um, remodeling, refurbishing hotels, et cetera, office buildings, to really help address the affordable housing needs in our community. We'd like to do that within the next month. It wouldn't be specific to sure stay, but we'll talk about and give examples of where this has been a really effective strategy in other communities and how it can help us address our affordable housing crisis. Okay, thank you. I'd um, really like to know when and you know let me know so that I can help you get the word out so that we can let as many people know as possible so that they understand what you're trying to do. Council President Benton and Council Grout, absolutely, and thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, thank you. We'll now move to the journal. Vice President Lewis. Vice President, I move approval of the October 17th journal. There's a motion and a second for approval of the journal. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? That passes. We'll now move to communications and introduction. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC-168 on tonight's agenda for action. EC-168 is an authorization to supplement a professional technical agreement with Albuquerque Behavioral Health to provide substance use treatment. This will need a two-thirds majority vote. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Opposed? And that passes unanimously. Uh, we'll move on. I move the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC-182 on tonight's agenda for action. EC-182 is lease agreement between the city and Visions Sankofa. Same thing, needs a two-thirds vote for uh, the suspension of the rules. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hands. Yes. Opposed? And that passes unanimously. Vice President Lewis. Mr. President, I move approval of the letter. There's a motion and a second for approval of the letter of introduction. All those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Any opposed? That passes. We'll move to reports from committees. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. The Finance and Government Operations Committee met on Monday, October 24th, and reported out the following items. In the matter of EC 140, that it be approved. In the matter of ECs 136, 142, 143, 144, OC 17, and OC 18, that receipt be noted. In the matter of 037, 041, R68, R69, R70, R71, and R73, that they do pass. And in the matter of 044, that it be without recommendation as amended. I'll make a motion to accept this report. There's a motion and a second to accept the FGO committee report. All those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? And that passes. We'll move to deferrals or withdrawals. Councilors, any deferrals or withdrawals at this time? Yes, Mr. President. 
Uh, Councillor Sanchez. Yes, Mr. President, I'd like to move to uh, defer O-43, Safe Outdoor Space Permitting, uh, for further discussion. And uh, the co-sponsor is not here as well. Uh, I think there's some people that are going to speak on it, and we'll hear them. OK, thank you. So um, defer uh, to the next meeting. Uh, just I procedurally, uh, Mr. Melendres, should, should we should we move the deferral after the speakers if we're going to listen to the speakers? Mr. President, if you plan to listen to the speakers tonight, uh, you would want to at least call up the bill and then defer at that time. Um, That's fine. If you defer now, uh, then it would take it off the agenda essentially for tonight, and the speakers wouldn't have an opportunity to speak. <clears throat> there are three people signed up for that bill uh, on Zoom. Okay, so we'll just hear, we'll, we'll go ahead and move with the deferral. Uh, at this time, and then we'll hear from those folks when, when, when that item comes up. That's not an issue, right? Mr. President, if, if that's the way you want to do it, I was suggesting the opposite, though, that um, you actually bring the bill up, move okay. it, hear from the people. Right. That'd be more consistent with the process we would use for a deferral when we have people signed up to speak. Is that all right, Counselor? Okay, good. So uh, any other deferrals or withdrawals? Seeing none, we'll move to the consent agenda. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, uh, Vice President Lewis. I move approval of the consent agenda. And there's a second. And um, did you want to speak? Okay, that's a second from Councilor Grout. All those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Any opposed? And that passes. Um, we'll go to announcements. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be a Finance and Government Operations Committee meeting on Monday, November 14th at 5 p.m. This one will be via Zoom video conference. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be a Public Safety Committee meeting on Tuesday, November 15th at 5 p.m. via Zoom video conference. Councilor uh, Jones, I'll read this for her. There will be a Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee meeting on Wednesday, November 16th at 5 p.m via Zoom video conference. And then the last announcement is the council meetings for November 21st, December 5th, and December 19th will be virtual and will be held at 5 p.m. via Zoom video conference. And uh, the council will now take a dinner break. Recording stopped.
session. We'll start with uh, under approvals, EC-168. This is the authorization to supplement a professional technical agreement with Albuquerque Behavioral Health to provide substance use treatment. I move approval. There was a motion and a second from Councilor Bassan. Any questions or discussion, counselors, on this uh, technical agreement uh, supplement? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, item B under approvals is EC-182, the lease agreement between the City of Albuquerque and Vision Sankofa. I move approval. There's a motion a second from Councilor Davis. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor of EC-182, say yes and raise your hands. Yes. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. <clears throat> we'll now move to final actions. We're going to juggle this just a little bit. This first one is item A, and then we're going to go to item C so that some of our friends from, <clears throat> from one department to, can, uh, can be here and then can, can leave. Uh, but the first one is uh, Councilor Sanchez and Jones, 043. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, wanted to hear some uh, folks that wanted to speak on this amendment, and then um, we'll be uh, voting to defer. So for discussion purposes, you want to yes. move, move the uh, bill? That's and, correct. And I'll second that uh, for discussion purposes. And, um, and uh, we do have people signed up to speak. And uh, I know that you have amendments as well, Councillor, but that will be up to you whether you want to move those. But we'll go ahead and go to the public comment. First up, we have Karen Navarro, followed by Peter Kalitsis. Uh, good evening, Councillors um, and President Benton. I wanted to weigh in on, with some comments about the proposed safe outdoor space operators permit ordinance. First, there should be no requirement for the operator to provide on-site services other than food and sanitary provisions. <clears throat> Healthcare services and social services, including case management, could be brought to the site by one or more organizations via their own staff doing outreach to the site. Second, I'm concerned about the statement that, quote, persons with criminal backgrounds will be denied a safe outdoor space operator's permit. By changing the words will be denied to may be denied in an amendment, that would allow each person's criminal record to be evaluated as to whether it should prohibit the person from getting the permit. So a convicted sex offender would be disqualified or someone convicted of violent assault with bodily harm. But someone who was convicted of, for example, drug possession, shoplifting, or charges that resulted after the person was trafficked would not be um, prohibit them. So finally, uh, there should be no requirement that the operator has any experience managing an organization. It would be sufficient that the operator has actual experience working with people experiencing homelessness as a staff member or as an experienced volunteer. So changing the word and to and or would make that clear. Please consider these amendments, counselors, before voting on this ordinance. Thank you. <clears throat> Peter Kalitsis, followed by Rachel Baca. See, counselors, as part of Parkland Hills Neighborhood Association, we would like to address safe outdoor spaces at or adjacent to the Gibson Health Hub. The potential of locating a safe outdoor space by Gibson Health Hub, which could serve up to a thousand clients daily, uh, prevents us from meeting the intent of providing trauma-informed services. As Carol Pierce told the City Council at the budget hearing earlier this year, a capacity of no greater than 200 is trauma-informed, which best assists rather than discourages our most vulnerable population. If we want a facility to serve these most vulnerable city residents, while at the same time not overwhelming our surrounding neighborhoods, we need to carefully review the locations of these providers of services to the unhoused and exclude the Gibson Health Hub as an accepted location for safe outdoor spaces. Thank you for your consideration. 
Lastly, Rachel Baca. President Benton, counselors, as president of Siesta Hills Neighborhood Association, one of the Gibson Health Hub neighbors, we are concerned about the potential for a safe outdoor space at or adjacent to this facility. As Mr. Kalitza said, this, this facility, which has been reported to serve up to 1,000 clients per day, would not provide a trauma-informed safe space, which Carol Pierce has defined as 200 people maximum, and which would further overburden the area surrounding Gateway and our community, which has over 50% of providers of services to the unhoused. Early on, the city stated that there would not be encampments on the Gibson Health Hump, Hub property, but during good neighborhood agreement discussions, the city has been resistant to include a provision to exclude safe outdoor spaces at or near the Gibson site. For these reasons, we request including a provision excluding safe outdoor space mm. at or adjacent to Gibson Health Hub. Thank you. That's our speakers. All right, <clears throat> thank you. So, uh, Councillor Sanchez, we're back on uh, for you for your deferral or for if you choose to move any of the amendments. Yes, thank you. I just want to have a little more discussion with us as as we move forward, and then uh, we can uh, go ahead and defer. All right. So, there's a motion for a deferral, or is there a second? <coughs> second from Councillor Bassan. And um, any further discussion? Councillor Lewis. Mr. President, I, I believe an amendment that I had uh, um, had brought up made, made its way into the uh, iPads. And so I won't be moving that uh, you know, tonight. But um, it's meant to be a friendly amendment. So I'll work with Councillor Sanchez on, uh, um, on that the next time we see the bill. So if we, if we decide to add that. Thank you. Mr. President, could we just clarify the uh, motion is for a deferral to November 21st? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Any further discussion? There's a motion on the floor for uh, uh, a deferral until the, until the uh, 21st. All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. <clears throat> we'll move on to item C. This is R72, <clears throat> directing that the city not approve any site plan for the low density residential development at 3525 4th Street Northwest, Albuquerque, known as the Brown property, that is inconsistent with what was proposed in the request uh, for proposals process. I move a due pass. There's a motion and a second from Councillor Davis. And uh, we did have a, an additional amendment. There was one amendment that was passed previously to uh, this bill. There was one in the packet. I'm not going to be moving that amendment. Um, just for the information of anyone concerned here, uh, I think we've got to a point where the uh, developer in the neighborhood uh, have feel comfortable with with uh, with the way the uh, uh, the process for design moving forward has been uh, stated uh, in the bill as it, as it now stands as amended. We do have uh, three people signed up to speak, and so we'll go ahead and go to public comment. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Michelle Den Bleicher, followed by Holly Varela. Um, President Benton, members of the council, since there's nothing for discussion this evening and there's nothing to discuss on this motion, I don't have much to say. We look forward to moving forward with the Calle Corta project and working to secure the needed financing. So we would like the ability to start moving on and move forward with this. So thank you for your consideration. Thank, thank you. you. Holly Barella, followed by Chris Baca. Councillor Benton and fellow councillors, um, I would just echo what Michelle just said. We're very excited to move forward with this development. And uh, we appreciate you guys um, passing this and allowing us to move forward. It's going to be a beautiful property uh, with lots of fun and exciting things. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Chris Baca, followed by Tad Nemitsky. Thank you. Um, I guess I use the tall one because I'm the tall 
one of all the three. Um, just uh, thank you again for this. This has been a very challenging project. It goes from higher density, commercial, uh, live work, and then to the, the uh, single family development. We have done very difficult projects in the past with Councillor Betton. He um, has helped facilitate the first grocery store downtown, the Imperial Building. Um, there hadn't been a grocery store downtown in 50 years. And working together, we were able to get that done. The other thing that just happened quite recently is the first apartment complex, 42 units for, for the unhoused, and that was another joint effort. So this is another one of those. It's really difficult, but we've been able to power through these things in the past, and we look forward to doing that in this particular project. So we appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Baca. And, uh, and yeah, thanks to Yes Housing. We, we, had, we do have a great partnership with them over the years. And, and this was a particularly, or is a complex proje project because of this, uh, these two, two different kind of housing that, that uh, we haven't seen put together in a project like this in the past. And I think that's what, what instigated a lot of the discomfort in the neighborhood, neighborhood and, and, and honestly on my part. But uh, I think we're in good shape moving forward. Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to make sure that I understood everything correctly. Um, so you're not moving R72. Is that the way I'm understanding it? Or? Uh, w yeah, we did. We did move R72, and it, it's, it's so it's on the floor floor for approval. The amendment that was in the uh, packet it will not be moved. The one that was still okay. standing. Okay. Okay. So. Finally, Tad Nimitsky. Any other questions? Oh, we do have another speaker. Uh, I only had three on here, but there, there is another one. Yes, please. Tad Numiski. My name is Tad Numiski. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm wondering what's the interest Debbie O'Malley has with Isaac Benton? Debbie O'Malley, of course, she is co commissioner. Why is it she has interest in this project? What kind of interest she has in this project? That is one issue. Here is, of course, uh, I'm sure I would like to know how much yes housing receding for this project to, from the city to build this project. So anyway, that's so many questions. I'm sure people are those main, yes, housing. All this nonprofit, they should cons consider first all these people with mental health, take it from the street. Are they doing that? No, they helping people. They branding with mental health. I know what they doing. I, I know a lot of many people. Yes. So anyway, that is my comment. Thank you. No, sir. That is it. Uh, on on Zoom. They did not uh, appear, sir. Oh, okay. So, Thank you, Mr. President. so neither of those persons have shown up. So we're back on the bill. Any other discussions, questions, Council? Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I just want to clarify too that so there, everybody's in agreement now with this bill. I know we left it, and there was some, but everybody's been working hard in in the meantime, and so now. Right. Is this that bill, generally how yeah. between Yes Housing and between the neighborhood association and, and groups? Right, and so the, the low density resident, residential development, there, were, there was a, uh, uh, the developer came up with uh, some design guidelines for that future development. That's going to be down the road after we build the big project up front. Uh, but that, uh, the neighborhood got involved with that and made suggestions, and everybody seems to be on board with uh, 
with those design guidelines that will apply to any future development of the uh, single family product. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, I'm glad to hear that, yes, housing is, is supportive of this, but I really do have some, some concerns, and I think I addressed them a little bit at the last meeting, and I t asked Shanna, you know, how frequent has the council got involved in kind of moving the goalpost at the, at the last moment? And, and so I still have some of those concerns, you know, that if a counselor doesn't like something after something has been approved and, and an applicant has went through the entire process, that that goal post has changed. So is this um, typical of how we do things or is this a little out of out of uh, character for council? Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Pena, I'll echo what I said last meeting, which was from my time on council, which is about seven years with the body. Um, I haven't seen a resolution quite like this come forward before. This is a first for my time here. But I, I, I'd like to answer that, Councillor, because I think it's directed uh, at me and my role in this project. And my role in this project goes back uh, eight or ten years now. Uh, prior to my time, or when, when it was going to become clear that, that uh, it was ten years, it was around the time that it was clear that the district lines were going to change and I was going to be the Councillor for this part of the North Valley on the east side of the river and I'm a longtime supporter of affordable housing, and I was responding to my constituents. There was a very lengthy neighborhood involvement process that, that uh, certainly took a lot of time, and um, that was something that my constituents demanded, and I uh, stood up for them, and I continue to stand up for them, and with regard to this single-family product, it is not the same thing that was proposed, so it wasn't all signed, sealed, and delivered. It's not the same thing that was proposed uh, uh, because at the time that we put this out for proposals for developers, and there were two respondents, and yes, was the su successful respondent, um, the single family component in the back part of the site uh, was proposed differently than what's now going to be built. And so that, uh, to me, and, and furthermore, uh, the affordability component of that single family product was, uh, is, is being proposed to be taken away. Now that's not addressed in this bill, but that's something that's in discussion between the developer and the department, and I'm not part of that discussion. What I was involved in was what the neighborhood was concerned with, with the design quality of the, of the project what, that uh, uh, will follow the low-income housing tax credit product, product uh, being constructed, and uh, I stand by my involvement on behalf of my constituents. Well, thank you for your response, um, Mr. President, but I still have that kind of concern because, you know, when we talk about af affordability and building houses and lots of people here talking about that today, I just am concerned that when we're, um, you know, use this opportunity to be able to go back in after the applicant has responded to an RFP, um, did all the things that they said they were going to do, and then to go back, that that's not very consistent, and I don't think that's very supportive of increasing our, our housing stock in the city of Albuquerque. But I'm glad to hear that, yes, housing has come up with a consensus on this. So, um, and obviously, um, you guys have, have worked through um, some of the issues, but I know that costs money and time and, and staff effort to to continue the process as you guys move along. So I just, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be supporting the bill, but I'm not pleased with it. Mr. President, um, just wanted to ask uh, Ms. Schultz a question. Um, the way I'm reading the bill, it says directing that the city not approve any site plan. Am I not understanding it? So if you can explain that, please. Sure, Mr. President, Councilor Sanchez. Uh, the title says that it's directing the city uh, not approve any site plan for the low-density residential development at address um, that is inconsistent with the, propo with the proposed in the RFP process. Um, so there's kind of a condition on there that a site plan can certainly be approved by the planning department as long as that site plan is consistent with what the uh, proposer, Yes Housing, submitted as a part of the RFP process last year. Um, the attachment and amendment that this body passed at the last meeting 
submits a set of design guidelines that will bring their proposal much closer to what the RFP proposed last year. So with the correct design guidelines in place that this body approved um, at, the, at the last meeting, the planning department will be able to move forward move forward with approving a site plan as long as the proposed site plan is consistent with that um, attachment. Okay, just to clarify, and everybody is in agreement. Mr. President, Councillor Sanchez, my understanding from meeting with both Councillor Benton, the community members who were concerned with the design, and yes, housing, everyone is in agreement with the amendment that passed at this body last meeting. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other questions, uh, we'll move to a vote. And I just, again, uh, want to thank everybody concerned. Um, it has been a long process and, and a very, uh, very robust community involvement and uh, with all that comes with that. And hopefully it's all good. So I urge your support. We'll go to a vote. All those in favor of R72 as amended, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? And that passes unanimously. Now we'll move to item B, Councillors Pena and Lewis. So you want me to take it on? Um, thank you, Mr. President. I'll take it on, but I just put a mint in my mouth, so excuse me for one second. Mm. 047 is amending A27211, the Transit Fairs Ordinance to improve transit access to allow all persons while providing accountability, creating um, a new section 7213 of the transit system ordinance to conclude the zero fare pilot project December 30th, 2022, and, to, and creating a section 2, 1120 of the budget ordinance to create an operating fund for motor, co motor coach and paratransit operators' salaries, establishing rules for issuing para, um, for issuing transit passes, requiring a study to develop a transit pass management program, development of a long-term security plan for the operations of facilities of the Albuquerque Transit Department, requiring transit security incident response tactical plan, um, quarterly reporting of security calls for service in transit um, in the transit system and making an appropriation. I move a due pass, and then I, I don't know how you want to handle this, uh, Mr. President, but we do have a floor substitute that maybe we can um, move the substitute first. All right, is there a second for the due pass? Second by Councilor Lewis. And then, um, uh, yes, the uh, floor substitute is in the iPads, and so you can move that uh, at this point. I'd move floor substitute 047. Councilor Bassan, and we'll need a vote for the uh, floor sub. All those in favor, say yes. Raise your hand. Any opposed? And that passes. Uh, so it, this, we're now back on the bill as substituted. And uh, I think uh, we want to have a, a uh, staff report, or ha how would the sponsors like to proceed? Well, Mr. President, um, did you want to? OK. Well, Mr. President, um, you know, we have staff here to explain the bill, and I just want to talk about, you know, there was some public comment about the, um, about removing it. The, the free fares was going to expire um, December 30th, 2022. So at that point, we had to do something. And so um, I had put forward a resolution which called for a safety plan, which is, is still in the queue, and it's going to be coming up here in front of council. Um, then Councilor Lewis contacted me and said that, you know, based on some of the security concerns, he was proposing uh, an ordinance, and he talked to me about the ordinance. And I just really want to say that, you know, talk about compromise in, in this day and time, and, you know, we're right on the, on, on the eve of an election tomorrow. I just really appreciate Councillor Lewis and his willingness to, you know, work and try to make this bill a, a good bill that's, that's fair and it addresses the issue. Um, we met with um, several people. We rode the bus. <laughs> we talked with people on the bus, and and you know, just really trying to come up with something that I think it's um it's not accurate to say that we're doing away with the free fares because the free fares are still there, and um, I I think I could defer to the staff maybe at this point to really talk about 
what's in the floor substitute would might be the best thing to do um, now. Mr. President, okay. counselors. Uh, yes, the floor substitute. Um, I guess I should back up. Do you want me to first quickly go over the regular bill and then the floor substitute, or do you just want to start with the floor substitute? I might need to. They're both long. Ms. Ms. President, yeah, Tom, if you would, yeah, a brief summary of the overall bill and then the changes that the amendment or that the substitute provides, and and I think it's important uh, to note too that a lot a lot that's reflected in this floor substitute is because of a lot of the public comment, the emails and discussions that we've had, you know, both with the department and and the public. I mean, for example, there was questions about uh, the study that was done, the internal study, and the accuracy of of the uh, um, the increase in calls to service and so there's this the floor amendment addresses that moving forward in the next year how we how we will you know change some of the gathering of that information and studies and get better and also really works hard to try to remove any kind of barrier uh, to anybody who wants a, a free bus pass and um, gets very specific on student IDs and veterans IDs and and uh, uh, military and and, uh, and 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 just that's why it's a pretty long bill because we wanted to be pretty comprehensive and remove any kind of barrier possible and think of those things through so um, anyways I kind of got it started but Tom if you would uh, if you would summarize that I appreciate it sure so counselors just going I think going using the bullet points in the write-up uh, for the summary of the original bill 02 um, 2247 uh, that bill there it concluded the free fare program and com and required compiling of a postmortem report most mortem report it concluded the free fare program as of December 31st which would have been an early conclusion to the pilot my understanding is from the administration unless I'm correct is the pilot is scheduled to go to, Je to June 30th is my understanding of 2023 so that's what the original bill did um, it then created a new fare structure under that fare structure what it did was it allowed children under the ages of um, five to be on board free it also, and I have to go back through that, it also created a system where, and I do apologize, um, quickly go over that, children under the age of, uh, would ride free, uh, students, um, and I apologize, I have the wrong bill, so I'll stand back quickly. Um, children under the age of five ride free, um, and then from there, there would be a distribution of passes. So everybody else technically could write, could either, would either have to pay the dollar fare, so it would reinstitute the fare. However, from there then, and at that time it was just a dollar for both Sun Van and ABQ ride, um, as previous to the system, uh, to the um, to, to the zero fare pilot, it had been $2 for Sun Van, $1 for Albuquerque ride. Um, then there would be a pass system. They would get what was kind of a, a universal pass. Uh, the universal pass would be available to all people they would, um, it would be for 36 month term. Um, they would have to go down and they would have to go somewhere uh, to have the pass issued. In other words, they would have to be, go to a distributor or just transit. They would have to go have the pass issued to them. They would have to be, there'd be an application. They kind of identify basically saying, you know, this is where I live. This is where uh, my, 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 date, my date, my birth, um, my date of birth, my name, um, and so, so stuff like that, or whatever transit determined was the most appropriate information they needed. Then from there, um, they would have the 36-month pass. Then, however, the experimental fares, uh, such as with Transit One Try New Program, could still be put in a place that would not be a pass eligible. So that was what that system did. It then would encourage the department to go ahead and work with uh, other departments or other agencies, be they social service agencies or the library or whatever other agencies to help become distributors of the passes to make it um, as a universal as possible to get to the pass, to reach the pass or have one issue. Um, then with that, it also instructed the department to work to see if they could get to a point where they could uh, get a pa get, uh, bring in new technology so that as time went on, the passes could be read on board the bus or they could get e-passes. So that was it. Then from there, the bill um, went on to address two other major issues. Uh, the other one was, was to try to address the bus driver shortage and so what it did was it tried to say whatever fares are collected, if that could go towards the, um, the, towards the salaries for the drivers. And that, what that did is it created a new um, a st strategy within the, um, within the budget. For instance, when you pass the general fund budget, we say we passed general fund 110, 
that's a strategy. So it, it created a strategy specific to transit. I believe they have strategy 642 for their general fund. This would be something within that 600 series. All um, then with that, um, it then introduced, basically it incorporated in the bill R70 that Councilor Pena had introduced into the Finance and Government Operations Committee. And what that did was it did, first of all, it requested a short-term tactical plan be created between uh, Metro Security, who has right now um, charge over transit security, the Albuquerque Police Department, and the Albuquerque Community Services Department. That They come together, create a tactical plan within 30 days. Um, the goal was, was to try to make sure that there's improved communication and coordination between these agencies so that basically if Metro Security had an incident on a bus or they needed help, they could, looking at the type of incident, could either um, uh, reach out to APD and, and be somewhat insured of an APD response or reach out to ACS and be insured of their response to help work with the situation. Uh, that was that. Then it also included in that that the transit begin working out what they call a no ride list. And what that would do is that it would look at people who have been convicted or cited for a crime on the bus or, or a citation of a misdemeanor on the bus, that they would, transit would be able to put them on a no ride list. It then created a pro, required the transit department try to create a process by which they would enforce that. Now the reason for that is, is that the issue is, is that if you have a no ride list and if somebody who's created an issue before wants to get on the bus, do you have the bus driver try to stop them? And that probably is not most likely effective means. So it was to try to find some other process by which um, it would be addressed, whether it be let them on the bus and the bus driver notify security, then down the line as they exit the bus, security would address the situation or something of that nature, that just being an example, not exactly it. So that was it. That was the um, short term. Then it also required a long-term plan. And that came from the perspective that Many agencies that are transit size, um, particularly when you have an area in this uh, which has high capacity routes, such as the ABQ ride and the blue line, you have a number of, um, of regular coach routes and high frequency um, regular coach routes, plus you have a fairly good sized paratransit system, plus we link into, even though it's another agency with a commuter rail, usually those agencies have a designated transit um, security. Um, and so what it did is it, it kind of said it's about time maybe transit graduate to that level, that they look at a plan, that they develop a long-term plan over the course of nine, ten months, get back to the, to get back to, um, to the council on how they would develop that plan, how they would develop such as agency. They look at best practices around the country. They would, um, I think, look at what is the best model. Is it a model of a transit security department, police department, which some agencies have? Is it just a, a transit? A metro type security, is it an ACS type model or is it a combination of the, of the group? So in other words, what's your best plan, coordinate it, and then also how would that fit into the city's current commitments to the CASA and to McClendon and any other uh, commitments it has on regarding its policing services and also how would it interact with the Civilian Police Oversight Board? Basically go through all those details, get back a plan for the council to interface with. So that primarily was what that program did. It also granted $150,000 to do the short-term and long-term security. So with that, once the bill was introduced, we then met with the transit department and asked for their input. And what their input was is what came out of the floor substitute. The differences with the floor substitute is what transit pointed out is they could have up to 70,000 people who would require a pass. So they'd like to reorganize that. And how that's reorganized is that they first like to see where they would have um, people, certain kinds of photo IDs that are already issued would work as a pass. Those are, first of all, they upped the age of students who can enter free, any, people who can enter free under any time, would be 10 and under. Um, that is consistent with what was occurring before zero fares. Second, they also wanted, um, under federal rules, uh, they asked that people who have Medicare at least get half fare. So what the floor substitute does, it says if the person has a Medicare card, which is not a photo ID, and they have a photo ID card, they can get on board the bus. Now, that is somewhat redundant because it also um, introduces a pass, which is anybody who has a, a photo ID over the age of 62 can get on the bus for free. It would also uh, apply to students. Any student, be they a kindergartner at APS who has a photo ID, all the way up to a doctor or postdoctorate at UNM and CNM who has a photo ID, could board the bus. 
It would also apply to anybody with an act, in the active military ID or a Veterans Affairs ID. They felt that these are IDs that would allow them to be able to know who's on the bus and would take care of a large percentage of their, of their clientele. Um, that would reduce the number of passes that have to be issued. Regarding the passes, they said that the technology part had already to a certain degree been developed, that many transit agencies are already using e-passes or passes that they can get on, the, they can get on their phone. Um, the only difference is that these passes yet do not have the technology for photo ID. So these passes would be, they, the next pass is the universal pass. Instead of having to come somewhere to get a file, to get a pass, you would be able to just go on your phone and, use the, and, and, and download the pass. The pass, the other thing, if you do not have a phone, it would also, you could go on the website. So that means somebody could go um, to use their own computer. They could go to a friend's computer, a family member's, a social service agency's computer, library's computer, wherever there's a computer, go onto the website, and they could order a pass. And they could, one, first of all, print out a temporary pass for a month. That'd be a paper pass. And then at the same time, transit would mail them a pass. What this information would only require would be their name, their date of birth, and just some place to contact them, whether it's an email, a phone number, an address, a message point. So the example, and particularly what the, the goal there was try to make it as, 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 as accessible as possible to these people such as the unhoused, so that if an unhoused person didn't have a phone, they could go to a social service provider, they could get the order of the pass, the social service provider could use them as an address, a message address, um, the social service provider could have the card mailed there. The second thing the bill, the final thing the bill does is that we'd also been told by social service providers that the people oftentimes live on the streets, lose, you have their passes, their wallets stolen or lose things. So it does say that you can order the pass as many times as possible, the uh, plastic card, um, and that the city would pick up the cost for it. Um, I think in that the assumption, my understanding from the, from the sponsors that they would work with in the budget process to make sure transit was covered for those additional passes. So that was kind of basically the major changes regarding the passes. The other final change was that we up transit asset to implement all of this with the security studies, that we up the, uh, from, the, um, unreserved, from, the un, from the unreserved fund balance, we increased the fee from 150000 to 250000 So that is primarily um, what it is. I also forgot uh, to add in that the, both the floor substitute and the original bill require that we get, that they put together a quarterly statistical report. And I think that was, was to just try to really make sure we get a strong handle as to exactly what is occurring regarding um, crime on the buses or not crime on the buses. Um, just that it's just a, a subject that's going to be necessary for as we go forward with a security plan. Um, and so we're hoping with a quarterly report and with some additional, like 250,000, that a little bit more resources can go in to collecting this data. Our understanding right now, the data is collected by the Metro Security Division. My understanding is they don't have a dispatcher yet, so they kind of have to have the officers and their supervisors put together. So it's kind of a burden, and that, of course, kind of risks getting the data correct. So this would just kind of help get that all correct and straightened out. Um, and there'd be a quarterly report so that we could kind of mark trends um, on that one there. Now, already there is data given on a monthly basis, so I think to a certain degree that would be kind of a building on that. Um, and with that, I'll, that, that concludes my report. Thank you. So back to the sponsors. You wanna, we do have people signed up for the public comment. Yeah, Mr. President, I think we'll, um, we'll, we'll vote on the, uh, to approve the floor amendment tonight and then make, we'll, we'll make a motion to defer, but I think we need to hear from public comment tonight as well, right? Yes. Just a matter of procedurally, that would be the correct um, process? Okay. Mr. President, before we go to public comment, can we have, I think we have transit security and the director with us this evening to kind of talk to us a little bit, because this is where we got some of the information about security concerns on, on the bus. So if um, you would come down before we go to public comment to, to talk about some of the concerns with security. And we really appreciate you all working um, to make this a better, a better ordinance. Mm -hmm.
Okay, Council President and Councilors. Um, yes, so thank you for, for um, getting some of our input and allowing us to have some conversation with this um, ordinance that is in front of us here this evening. Um, I will say that, that our, our main goal at Transit is, is to main ac maintain access as well as um, you know, make sure that the service is equitable. So really what a lot of the conversation that, that I've been having in the three, less than three months that I've been uh, director for the Transit and Albuquerque ride um, is really just pushing safety, security, service, and then equity. So um, really trying to make some strides here over the last three months and, and how we are moving forward with that. Um, as far as the security numbers and all that, I can have um, GSD talk to that. But before we get into that, if I could just really briefly kind of give you an idea of some of the things that we are doing to try and move transit forward here when it comes to safety and security. Um, we are really, like I said, safety to me is, is extremely important. There's really no use to having a transit service if it's not going to be a safe place for you to go to. So I believe that that is, you know, has to be above all else. And that is the message that's being communicated to my team. And that's to everything. So every time we have some sort of safety issue out there, we take it extremely seriously. Um, and also, you know, assess it to see what we can do differently going forward. Um, we recently just started this week um, reamping our training for uh, the bus drivers. So they're all going through mandatory de-escalation training to help with some of the issues that we do see on the bus to try and, you know, bring issues down instead of um, escalating upwards. Like it said, it's de-escalating them and hopefully maintaining those problems um, at a lower degree. Um, we do have the, the mobile security that um, is, is out and about, as well as um, some security teams that are on buses that are being moved around throughout the transit network, especially on our routes that we see that have the most issues out there. Um, as you heard a couple months ago, we do have the 2,600 cameras that are now active across all the buses, sun vans, at the art platforms, as well as the CUTC and the ATC, and looking to bring the Uptown Transit Center online here shortly. And we're working to improve that communication between the buses and direct to the RTCC, which we don't have right now. It goes through dispatch. Um, we do have our leadership riding the buses. So I'm out there every chance that I get jumping on a bus, as well as the deputy directors um, and our associate director, all the way down to our supervisors and our managers um, to see you know, what's actually going on out there, get some good input from the bus drivers while they're out in their area, as well as the citizens that are, that are riding the buses. Um, we are working on onboard messaging, so I think that this is a big deal for me. In fact, that um, you know, as you hear things and you hear what the behavior expectations are on ABQ Ride, it starts to really get you in that mindset of, okay, so this is the behavior that's expected, what things won't be tolerated, and you just hear it and it's ingrained into you. So that positive messaging is something that we'll be working to push out um, on board on all the buses and sun vans. Um, and then the barriers, we are working on the barriers for the drivers. Unfortunately, you know, that only protects the drivers. So, you know, we still have this, this um, need to protect the citizens and the people that are riding the buses and the sun vans as well. So that is another area that we're working on. Um, and then the meetings weekly. I know um, this ordinance does talk about getting together with APD, with GSD, and with ACS. And that has actually been ongoing since the beginning of the year when the zero fares started and will continue to go forward. I think a lot of the conversations have been a lot deeper um, as we've moved through the zero fares and trying to come up with new ideas. And some of these issues that I just talked through are some of the ideas that have come out of those meetings. Mr. President, thank you. I don't know if anyone has any questions, but, oh, I'm sorry. Mr. President. Uh, Councilor Passai. Mr. President, I, I mean, I would love to hear from you, Director, about your, your thoughts on, so let me back up. I was in a meeting briefly this last week in particular, but it's come up more than once where I have people asking me all the time, where's the data about crime occurring on the buses? And so I would love to hear your thoughts about crime on our buses and how it may, I know you've only been here with th for three months, but at the same time, like how it might have changed since zero fares has started. And then I would like to hear from APD on their thoughts regarding uh, crime, because I have heard many times uh, now that a lot of buses are being used as getaway cars. Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of extra. I don't wanna start giving the examples necessarily that I've heard, but I would love to hear the thoughts from APD and from you, Director, on, on crime on buses so that the public can hear as well kind of where we're at with that. Uh, Council President, Councilor Bassan, I, I would say that, um, you know, looking through some of the security um, information that we're provided from GSD 
and, and just um, looking through it here, when you look at first quarter of um, this year versus second quarter of this year, ridership and the security calls have pretty much gone up coincidentally with each other. So about a 17% to 18% rise in, in each. Um, I don't know how good the comparison is prior to zero fares, so I can't really assess that. Um, ridership has gone up and so have some of the security calls. And then I would also say that from what I see from the, fair, uh, the zero fares reports that we put out on a monthly basis, is that 53% of those calls um, are security checks, which is just basically you know, security out doing their normal thing. Most of the time it doesn't result in further action, so that's a big portion of that. I, I believe if um, disorderly conduct and loitering will bring in about 71% of the total calls that we're seeing out there. And then I think part of it too is that um, you know, we've had a little bit more light shed on this, so I think, you know, and. GSD, I'll let them speak to it as well in security, but I think that they are starting to maybe track some of the stuff a little bit better too, which may be why you see some of the numbers a little higher than, than they may have been before. Mr. President, if we can go ahead and get APD's opinion as well about, I mean, I've had my own, again, personal conversations regarding, regarding this, but since I was asked what I've heard and where I got it from, I think that it's great for APD to be able to share some of their experiences with how things may have changed since this has happened. Uh, Chief Medina, as we've got him on. President Benton, uh, Councillor Bazan, you know, I think we could sum up what APD has seen uh, with the buses into three categories. Uh, the first category, and I agree with the Director of Transit, that uh, the biggest thing we see is the loitering and the issues at the bus stops. The second biggest thing we're seeing is uh, individuals who are using the buses uh, as a means to uh, go out and commit crimes in various parts of the city. And then the last is, you know, actual crime uh, upon the bus. So those are the three biggest issues that we're facing. Uh, you know, I do get complaints from the community uh, and a lot of businesses about uh, all three of those, well, the first two topics. Uh, the, the business community generally doesn't really complain about what's going on on the bus because they're unaware. But, uh, you know, APD is committed to whatever decisions are made that we'll continue to work with transit and, and see what we could do to, uh, to uh, alleviate some of the problems. But those are the three biggest issues that APD has seen. Uh, the loitering at the bus stops and the issues there, uh, they do use it as a means of transportation while committing crime. And the third thing is, you know, the actual crime that sometimes occurs on the bus. Thank you, Chief. Mr. President, Chief, do you think that zero fares, uh, if, if we had some kind of pass system re-implemented, even if it still meant people could ride without a fare, if there was some kind of pass or whatever alternative is going to be decided by this council, do you think that would affect and possibly minimize some of the crime that's happening on the buses? You know, what it would do is it would give us investigative leads. If we had a way where somebody was documented who was on the bus and uh, who was utilizing the bus, uh, we could use that information to help us track individuals down, uh, see who our individuals are, especially like in the uptown area where we do tend uh, to get a lot of complaints from uh, some of the business districts there around the mall, I would give us uh, an idea of where to be looking and uh, individual suspects that uh, we may be trying to, to apprehend and uh, take into custody and charge. Thank you. Councillor Davis. Uh, Mr. President and, and Chief Medina, while you're here, I want to come back to that transit director, but if the chief is still here with us, we lost him. There we go. Uh, chief, thanks. I appreciate that. I. Councillor uh, Feeblecorn has actually been raising some of these issues, and just while I have you, uh, I wanted to ask, you know, one of the things we saw was the Attorney General made a comment at some point at the organized crime retail sort of group that, that, he, that crime offenders were using our buses as getaway vehicles, and we heard that a couple of times tonight. But I just read a news article where his office clarified that that was only one incident they were aware of, and they weren't making any judgment on the free fare program. Um, I recall from, uh, from my days as a police officer that we always, when we wrote 42s, when we wrote reports, had to talk about the getaway vehicle, the type of vehicle or, that was used. Has the department done any data, uh, data analysis to determine how many buses were used in the commission of a crime versus other vehicles or feet, et cetera? I know that data must be available to us. Um, President Benton, Councilor uh, Davis, I don't have that data readily available, but I could ask uh, Deputy Griego to mine us some data to see uh, how many times the bus has been listed. And like I said, I think the priorities go threefold. First off, uh, the biggest complaint is 
uh, the loitering and the individual that the bus stop, then the bus being used as, as a getaway means, and then the third uh, being actual crime within the buses. So uh, I could look into that. I could get some information Thanks. back and see what we have uh, listed uh, from those cases. Uh, thanks, Chief. I appreciate it. Yeah, and, and I, I don't discount the fact that loitering is an issue. Uh, you know, I, I live on Central. I, I go to ART stations nearly every day, one way or the other, and cross them. We know that we're not doing a good enough job uh, protecting good riders uh, from folks that are just hanging out and, uh, and doing God knows what uh, and taking advantage of our public space, and we're having that all over the city. But as much as we keep hearing this, bad guys are using the bus, we do have data available, and I would appreciate it. I think it's good for us to get real data and not rely on some of that anecdotal uh, information. So thank you, Mr. President. If and I could have one with the, the director while she's here, uh, it's good to see you. I, I heard you mention, and I appreciate this very much, um, that we don't have the data currently available for before sort of the comparison of incidents before and after free fares. But I'm not sure that's totally true. Um, in November, uh, in fact, of this year, um, in October last month, your office, uh, the department produced a zero fare fact sheet that was shared with the city council as part of its quarterly reporting requirements for the zero fare pilot program. And it listed the number of safety incidents and incident security incidents um, on the transit program before and after zero fare. The number portion of incidents to riders before zero fare was 0.12%. So in other words, 0.12% of times a person of a rider uh, engaged in some type of incident. The average since free fares has been 0.12 according to the transit department in spite of the fact that the transit department says that they are now handling roughly 60 percent of their calls are just those security checks where they were just 38 percent of calls before the free fare program and so what we see is that according to the transit department's own data there are fewer security incidents since zero fare and there are more preventative actions by the security agents from uh, security officers from Metro Security. Um, and so I, I just want to point out that, you know, we have a lot of speculation and we're saying, well, this past program is supposed to stop crime on the buses, but we have fewer incidents, more security officers, fewer incidents on the buses themselves. Now, I do think we ought to do more at the bus stops. And so um, I wonder if, um, I want to be sure we share that information, and I know the council staff has that, and we can share that around um, in emails before our next meeting. Um, and Director, no, I don't mean to call you out. I appreciate it. You weren't here for some of that, and I want to be sure we share it. But I do think it's really important that we talk about this uh, in real ways. But then my last question, and we can bring this up at the next meeting, uh, where I'm sure we'll get into more detail. Mr. Real, if you could help us a little bit. Um, I was here during, most of us, some of us were here um, during the ART debate and debacle. Um, but one of the things that I negotiated as an amendment into the ART application and budget was a million dollar line item for transit specific security. I think Councillor Benton uh, supported that as well. And the administration, the current administration never fulfilled that. They actually came back and decided to move that into Metro security um, for a citywide effort to cover other security facilities along with transit. Um, and, you know, I think the council supported that as a tactic and a strategy to see what we could do here. But it seems to me that um, the, this bill in itself fails in, in one way, that if it's trying to address security, it doesn't necessarily, it, it allocates new fare, new dollars to, to bus drivers, which is important, but it doesn't do anything for security. Um, and I wish, I wonder if the administration has any comment or can bring us some comments back for the next meeting on whether the experiment for merging uh, Metro security and transit security and using the million dollars that was designated for buses and bus stops um, should be returned to the transit department because we're not currently spending that much, quite frankly, on transit security. That was my long speech. <laughs> Mr. President and Councillor Davis, I, I do recall that conversation several uh, years ago, and there was 14, if I'm not mistaken, that were going, 14, um, if you will, security officers that were going to be assigned to transit to uh, support the ART project and its operations going forward. Um, we did move the entire organization, if you will, all of security into one department. Um, over the last uh, months, we've been working with, um, Transit has been working with GSD to create a structure much like the airport has with APD with their officers. If you recall, airport has APD officers at the airport that 
that work together hand in hand, but they have a memorandum of agreement that structures how many officers will be there, et cetera. So the idea is to take that same, if you will, uh, structure and put it in place because we support the idea of having those security officers that were designed and paid for through that program um, assigned to the department so that the department has at least um, a number of officers that they can, uh, security officers they can call upon to help support the transit system. I will say, as, as with everything else, especially in the, in the world of security, <clears throat> our challenges in keeping those positions filled have been very, very significant. And, uh, and we continue to experience that and have been experiencing that for some time. But the idea here is to structure something that is much more, if you will, uh, structured, and also that uh, our transit director can uh, rely upon as they start looking at this issue. But uh, let me get back with you and give you a little more details of how that project is going along, and, and, and we'll uh, report that at the next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I fully support that idea of trying to return to a transit-specific security force or a specific uh, allocation for that. I'd love to hear more about that. I would support that part of this bill. I think there's a piece of that in here that I think is really important and uh, would love to see how we could support that part. Um, but I'm not there yet on, full fa on the, the past system for all the reasons that we've addressed today and, and we'll continue to hear from. So thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Peeble Corn, and then Councilor Lewis. Thank you, Mr. President. I have quite a few questions. Um, since this bill did not go to committee, I'm going to ask them all here tonight. But while we have Chief Medina, if we still have Chief Medina, um, I'd love to do a follow-up on something that he just said. I think I heard him say that one of the benefits of having the pass system would be that we could um, track people that are using the bus. And um, it's my understanding from this proposal that we would be tracking people who applied for fare, for free passes, but we would not be tracking people who paid a dollar. And so I'm just wondering if there is any data to support the idea that only people who need free fares are going to be committing crimes on the bus. President Benton, uh, uh, Councilor Fieber I think that uh, that you are absolutely correct. Only individuals who were would be using a pass would be the individuals would be capable of uh, tracking. It's another tool in our toolbox. It's nothing that we would purposely go out and look to see who is who is doing this. And yes, you're absolutely correct. There are times that somebody who paid a dollar to use the bus may uh, not may be committing a crime, and we wouldn't be able to track them. And there's times that individuals who uh, use the pass may be using it. I think the spirit of this conversation was the end of that what free bus fare has done uh, to the bus and what we're seeing with the buses in relationship to the free bus fare. So, uh, like I said, it would be another tool in our toolbox. It's just uh, was a question presented to us. Uh, would it help? And yes, it would help us uh, be able to track uh, certain individuals. Would it help us track those who paid cash? But it would help us track those who are utilizing the free fare. Okay, so just to be clear, there's no data that, we're, that would suggest that uh, low-income people are more likely to commit crimes on the bus than people who can afford to pay fares? No. Thank you, sir. Um, I have a couple other questions. Um, in the bill, it references a 25% increase in calls for security service at bus stops and on buses in the, just the first quarter of 2022. But as Councillor Davis just mentioned, the incidents have stayed relatively flat. It's 0.12% from December and then also last month. So I'm just wondering where that 25% came from. And if we can all agree that the data that's been released from the transit department is that the actual data that we should be using when we're making decisions about transit. Mr. President, Council Fiebelkorn, um, we evaluated a report, a free fare report that came out of the transit, transit department that listed the number of incidents before the free fare and the number that had been recorded through the first quarter. And the sheer numbers that were reported represented a 25% increase in that number. It was the number of calls to Metro Security and not APD. And so it was taken straight out of the report that the transit department produced. Thank you, Mr. Melendrez. So that was a straight out number of increases in security calls, not accounting for the fact that when free fare, before pre fares, we were in a pandemic and there were very few people riding the bus. Um, and as the ridership increased, it's not surprising that security instances increased as well. So we're just taking a flat number, we're putting it in legislation and using it as, an, as a reason 
to stop giving people of Albuquerque access to free fares. Thank you. Pastor Lewis. I have more questions. Sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I also wanted to visit, um, also in the bill, um, Attorney General um, of, United, of New Mexico is quoted, and it says that he believes this misuse of the transit system is the result of the free fare pilot program. And I just wanted to bring everyone's attention to um, quotes from um, the Source New Mexico article that was just published today. When contacted, AG's um, office spokesperson, Jerry Mayers, said that there was evidence of one instance where this occurred, talking about the getaway issue, I mean, clarified that the AG's office was not, quote, making an inference that bus rider fees are directly associated with criminal activity. I reached out directly to the Attorney General, um, and he sent me this quote. It is my hope that the City Council will conduct a comprehensive safety assessment out of the concern for families and the elderly using the transit system. There must be a reasonable balance between maintaining public access and strengthening public safety. He left me a voicemail that said, and I quote, I just want to be clear, I did not say free fares was the cause of crime, and he's available to clarify and explain that to anyone who'd like to discuss that with him. So I just would like it on the record that, again, we're using data from someone that never said what's in this bill. So, um, I also wanted to ask the transit director, um, in the bill it says that motor coach operators have left employment with the city citing safety concerns since the inception of free fares. There were no safety concerns prior to free fares. Uh, Council President, Council, Councilor Feeblecorn, um, I, I did speak with our human resources team about this specifically um, as far as drivers' resignations. Uh, we don't actively seek out feedback right now as to why drivers have left. And I, I can say the period from October 1st of 21 to October 30th of 22, we had 71 drivers leave. Um, between October 1st of 20 and October 31st of 21, 61 drivers leave, and then that period prior to that, 85 drivers leave. But we don't, can, we don't keep data on whether okay. or not it was related Thank to you. zero fares or security. Thank you. Um, then I wanted to reference on um, page four in the bill, we, we talk about um, we're gonna return to free fares being a dollar, um, and we're gonna go to Sunvan for $2. Does this include art? Uh, at this point in time, Madam, Madam Chair, yes, it would be, it would include art. So can someone explain to me, perhaps the Director of Transit would be the best for this, how would someone um, get on art and then pay a fee or show their ID or show their pass? I was on the bus this weekend. I mean, I'm a regular bus rider, so it's not really a media event when I take the bus. But it reminded me that you get on on the left side, you get on in the back, and what would I have to do, walk all the way up through the accordion to the bus driver to show my bus pass? I don't understand how that's going to work. So, Madam Chair, now, um, unless it was art was free before zero fares, and that could be a mistake on my part, my understanding was is that art was that if you, you, was on kind of a, you bought your ticket at the, at the station and then you entered. And then, like many high-capacity systems, it, there would be occasional checks to see if you had your ticket stub. So this would kind of be the same thing. Basically, you would just enter art, um, and then if you had your pass with you, then that would be equivalent to having a ticket stub. So we're going to be only looking for people to ask for passes. I'm going to guess that I'm not going to get or, asked for my pass. Or maybe put it this way, uh, your ID or your pass, I guess, with that one there. So if you had one of the eligible IDs or passes. Okay. Um, if that, and that was my understanding is how art was working. I could be wrong. If it was free, before the zero fare, then probably the bill would have to be amended to reflect that. Okay. Um, is there any money for transit security in this bill? At this, at this time, Madam Chair, no, the, it's for the transit study for transit security. At this so there's, there's three things that are being funded through that, right? The 150 or the 250, I'm not sure which it is now. It's 250, right? So that's going to fund a fare pass and fare box management study, a transit security plan, and development of the free fare pass, um, which seems like a lot to do for $150,000. Where's the other 100000 going that's appropriated in this bill? Um, the, okay, so the, I mean the additional 100 in the floor substitute? Is that I'm looking at the floor substitute, and it says transfer to 
transit operating fund of 250,000, yeah. and mm -hmm. then it says 150 is designated for the purpose of funding blah, 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 blah. So let me see, that may be, let me look at that real quickly if I can. So that would be on the floor sub. Let me double check that um, if I could. So my, I'm looking at the floor sub. So that is a mistake. That is a, a technical error. It should be 250 is designated. Okay. So even the even the extra hundred thousand isn't going for actual security. So of the no. So the two the 250 thousand is simply for the study is for I think to assist with the tactical plan, to assist with the study, and to assist with the passing. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just don't understand what we're doing here. I don't understand how tracking some people, um, but not everyone. I mean, again, I can just go on and pay a dollar and you have no tracking of me. So it just doesn't seem to be solving the problem, the stated problem, which is that there are security issues on transit, which have always been there. I've been a bus rider in the city for 20 years. And I can tell you that there have always been security issues on our transit department. I don't see any uptick since free fares. But even if you do think that there are upticks in, since free fares, how is this solution an actual solution? How is saying that people who are poor and are going to need to apply for a free bus pass get tracked, and people who have a dollar every time they want to go somewhere get on, get off at will, it seems very classist, and I just I can't believe that this is the only answer we can come up with. I do want to say there's a lot of support. I don't hear anyone who doesn't support increased transit security, and I don't know why we're not focusing in on what actually needs to be done to keep the citizens of Albuquerque safe. Councilor Lewis. Mr. President. Well this, well, this bill is meant to be a, um, I mean, the beginning of a comprehensive plan. I mean, I think it has everything in it. To, you know, it identifies that there, there might be some missing data that we need. Um, but over the next six months, let's, uh, let's continue to build on that data. Um, you know, certainly there was, there was some data that we had before us uh, from studies that were internal. Um, uh, to uh, so there, I mean, there were some internal studies that we looked at that that were uh, that were a part of the development of this bill as well, um, and there are also a lot of anecdotal, you know, type. Um, you know, uh, Councillor Davis is correct that uh, um, you know that. Uh, that we can't just base this off some anecdotal stories. And that's true, we're not basing it off of just a few anecdotal type stories or instances, but there are a lot of anecdotal stories from many people that have you know, emailed us and, and my own experience riding the bus. Um, and uh, you know, again, emails, comments, uh, people we've talked to um, that were riders uh, on the bus that ride it consistently. Um, People that are homeless uh, that that told us they were homeless that said we don't feel comfortable and we feel like the uh, uh, this these buses have gotten a lot more unsafe over the last six months or so is what they said to us and so again this this bill isn't completely riding on that it's not why it was written it's meant to be as as um, the attorney general um, texted you or emailed you or something that uh, to, that the city should have a comprehensive plan you know based on data. Uh, and so, I, again, I think this bill addresses that. Um, I, would, <laughs> I would like to quote the Attorney General, and I take him at his word. I mean, he's the top law enforcement person in the state, right? So I, I t he's an attorney. I, I take him at his word. And so um, I can't really take a quote that he said and then, uh, you know, take it in a different way because, um, I, I don't know, I, I, I just, I'm going to take his words as the truth. And what he told KRQE, he said there was shoplifters that were using the bus system as their getaway vehicle. And he said, quote, he said, I think that the no fee for riders seemed like a well-intentioned policy. I think that the no fee for riders seemed like a well-intentioned policy. But there has to be safety requirements. 
He said, in other words, you can't just let everyone on the bus with stolen equipment. And so if you could text him that, as long as he's texting you, and, and ask him if he said that or ask him what he meant by that. But again, this, this bill is not riding on what the Attorney General told us. Um, but I, I got to admit that that did cause some concern when the Attorney General of this state uh, pointed out our, our free fare system and said, hey, the City Council needs to look at this. You know, we need to talk about this. And so, um, so that was a part of it. Um, the internal data that we have, um, our experiences, the many emails on the bus. And again, there, there's, we, we've never said that this is purely about a direct correlation between free bus fares, uh, the program, uh, and public safety. Uh, but again, it's a comprehensive way to look at how can we improve, how can we make it better, uh, these are some ideas. I think that's what we do as a council. We try to put forth some ideas. If you don't agree with it, don't vote for it. Um, but this is why we have these discussions. I, I certainly take issue with anybody that would question, uh, you know, Councilor Pena and I's um, uh, intentions of writing this and specifically in any way to disparage, um, you know, anybody that rides the bus for any reason, any purpose. Um, you know, we want to honor people that use the system. Recognize, I think this bill, this bill recognizes that it preserves uh, that ability to be able to, you know, to be able to ride these buses and, you know, for free. And so, um, and we just want to have a better quality of life and better experience for people who, uh, who do ride it. My own experience, to be honest, was um, our buses uh, um, are pretty dirty. You know, they're they smell like urine. Um, they're dirty, there's trash at every bus stop all over this town. Um, and uh, I don't think it's a real a good experience. I think we should make it better. I think it should be a, uh, a better experience for it. I mean, there was, we had several incidents of uh, people that were using fentanyl on the bus. Um, one at the, at the stop that we were at, another on the bus. A uh, bus driver who had to um, you know, stop the bus and go address the fact that people were uh, using fentanyl on the bus. So again, I'm not saying that that experience alone is that's why I'm you know, we're driving this. I mean, just just talking about again, you call that an antidote or you know call it data, but uh, you know these are some of the things that uh, and you can smirk about it and stuff like that. But I mean, I mean we're just we're just talking about uh, you know some experiences, people that ride the buses all the time, our experiences riding the bus, and saying how can we um, how can we make it better. Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to make a quick comment. And uh, um, where's Mr. Director? Uh, there you are. Um, my biggest issue in reference to this bill is is probably the fact that you hit on how many bus drivers have left and how many bus drivers we have. And I know we're shorthanded right now. And just going back into history, my father was a retired Albuquerque City Transit driver, and he was there for 32 years. And in the 32 years that he was there, he was very, very, very proud to, to do that job and very happy, so much set that he didn't realize that he had been there for 32 years and could have retired. He was really, really a good employee. And so I get concerned about the bus drivers, and because my dad was was an employee, um, he actually had us riding the buses for, um, gosh, probably age 17 is probably when I stopped riding the bus. And during that time versus what I've seen now is just a massive change, a massive contrast. And we used to ride the bus and pay a certain amount and, and pay the fees, and... and what I'm getting at is that the bus drivers, the bus drivers, really, really need some support in reference to their job and their job description, their pay, um, their safety is 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 very, very important. Um, I remember riding the bus with my dad, and he could get on that handheld radio that looked like a phone, and he could call for a police officer in two seconds, and the next police officer that drove by would stop and help him do whatever he needed on that bus. Um, and so I'm really concerned about the bus drivers and the fact that they're leaving with 
you know, they're leaving so so easily. And I know because I've spoken to several bus drivers. Actually, they quoted me on a story with the journal. And one of the things that was very, very important is that they felt that their safety was in danger now that we have the zero fare program. And so I'm very concerned about that. Also, I'm worried about what's going to happen now that the bus drivers uh, have to deal with individuals when they have to tell that individual, now you have to pay, or this is the process now. I know they're going to have plenty of time, as the bill shows, but eventually they're going to have somebody that does that. So I just really, really hope that along the way that we really, really work on making this a better place for our transit employees, the people that are out there doing the work. And it is extremely tough to be a bus driver right now. Um, and I think everybody here knows knows that, especially the folks that have talked about the zero fares. So that's that's my take on everything. I just hope that we really, really work hard to make sure that we do what we can to keep those employees um, happy and keep them working so that they can continue to serve our community. Thank you. Mr. Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I agree with Councillor Sanchez. You know, I think that we have um, a serious shortage of bus drivers. I know that transit goes out um, to every event. Um, they were with us at the state fair trying to get um, bus drivers. We've had conversations around literally routes are not being driven every day because we don't have enough bus drivers. And I feel like it makes um, almost no sense to add additional work onto those bus drivers by making them um, check IDs and check passes and do all those things, we're barely able to cover, and we're, in fact, we're not covering our transit routes right now. Um, but I did want to respond to um, Councillor Lewis on the quote from the AG, and I'm certainly not going to speak for the AG, um, but I would just caution us all to think about taking someone's quote out of context um, rather than just calling them up before you write them into a bill. For example, there was a quote today in um, Source New Mexico from Councillor Lewis that says, our bus system is not intended for everybody. I'm going to assume that that's out of context. And instead of writing it into a bill, I'm going to give him a chance to tell me what he meant. But again, um, we shouldn't be just assuming that once one quote means that that's actually all you thought and that there were no other extenuating circumstances. I think the AG has made it clear through various media sources this week that what he meant was that he wants to make sure that we have transit security, and I don't think that there's any disagreement from anyone that that is important. Thank you. Councillor Lewis. No. Well, I, I just read you a quote, um, you know, from the Attorney General, and, you know, thanks for the context. Thanks for the, I guess he sent you a text and gave you some more context, so we'll just take that for what he says now. So that's fine with me. Um, and, uh, what, what do you think I meant when I said uh, the bus system's not for everybody? You know, um, I think in the context of that, I mean, uh, there's just some people that uh, like to drive their cars, you know, and they don't ride the bus, and they'll probably never ride the bus. And so, um, but if you were insinuating in some way that I just don't like some people that ride the bus, um, you know, that's that's the problem I have with some of these arguments here that uh, are actually pretty completely uncalled for, you know. And again, you can smirk the entire time I'm talking, you know, but, you know, just, uh, um, I think no I just comments did. comments from the audience, you will be removed. He's going to keep com commenting. But please. I think I just, I clarified that pretty clearly. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I guess that was, that was in the Albuquerque Journal, uh, KRQ TV, uh, Source New Mexico. Um, I actually gave a really long extended interview to them that I probably shouldn't have, you know, because they're pretty bent, you know, in one way. Um, so, um, but uh, anyhow, yeah, let's 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 take all this stuff for what it's uh, at face value, and we all have our different opinions on it. I think hopefully we'll have a good discussion on it. That's the intention. And again, this is about you know, having some, you know, solutions, um, coming up with solutions, and and uh, offering those solutions, and we all have a chance to be able to decide on whether we agree with that direction or not. And if we decide not to go with this specific system, I mean, I'm open to other ways that we can continue to make the bus system better. Councilor Pena. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think we've already had, have we had the public speakers? We haven't even had the public speakers come up yet, have we? Um, yeah, so we're having this debate. But I just want to say that, you know, we have the free fairs. The free fairs are in place. I misspoke earlier. It ends in June. Um, it was supposed to end in June. Um, I just want to, and we also, I have a resolution. Um, I'm very supportive of free fairs. Uh, the reason I put it forward initially, then we um, got some data that we had some security concerns, put together a resolution that actually calls for a security plan. I think this is similar to what um, Together for Brothers was, was asking for, so that's still in the queue. But, you know, I just want to say that this is an attack on anybody's character or who's doing what or what and smirking. It's just really, I feel like this is very unprofessional. I just really want to commend Councillor Lewis for saying that, you know, I want to put together something and if we could work together to establish, to continue the free fares, to improve security on the buses. At the end of the day, I even told Councillor Lewis, if it doesn't pass, at least you try to do something. And I appreciate that about, about him. And, and, and with that, um, hopefully then the resolution will pass about coming up with a, a security plan. But I think that you know when somebody's trying to address security, when he's being told that there's security concerns on the bus and he's trying to address it, I, I appreciate that, whether I'm an agree or, and vote it down or not vote it down is another thing. But you know, I just don't like the direction that this whole conversation is headed. Thank you. Uh, so there's already been stated an intention to uh, defer. We 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 need to defer this bill. So um, and, and that's clear. So we've got 30 people signed up to speak, and I think we need to get onto that. So we're going to start uh, with the public comment at this time. Again, a one and a half minute time limit due to the numbers that we have to uh, accommodate tonight. Thank you, Mr. President. First on the list is Christopher Ramirez, followed by Baruch Campos. Good evening. Good evening, Council President and Councilors. My name is Christopher Ramirez. I'm a bus rider. I've ridden the bus more than once this past month, I, and I, I think that's important to say. I'm a current member of the city's Transit Advisory Board, have been the chair for the past two years, and I'm leadership with Together for Brothers, who's been organizing for five years on transit equity. Transit has had five years to do this work with community, and time and time again what we've seen is people are not showing up to work with community. Last month, the Transit Advisory Board passed a resolution calling for a community safety plan, and I want to make something really clear. 99.8% of the people who ride the bus, right, Councilor Feeblecorn, like you and me, experience no incidents on the bus, are not causing incidents on the bus. That is the current data that we have available since October of last year, including three months before zero fares. What I'm concerned about is an increase in security checks, where unlike the Albuquerque Community Safety Department, whose monthly meeting I, I also attend, and have transparency where we see racial data, of who's getting calls. We don't see data from Metro Security about what we know to be true because we've been hearing from black and native bus riders about being harassed on the bus. Councilor Fiebelkorn, like you had mentioned about who gets asked about payment on art or not. I'm concerned about being a person in Albuquerque who's lived without a photo ID before. Um, Zero Ferris is working. We are the envy of the country. I think what's great to mention is Las Cruces is moving to Zero Ferris this month as well. So we're going to be in good company. I look forward to organizing Thank with you, you all sorry, time for, or zero fares continuing indefinitely. Baruch Campos, followed by Anita Cordova. Hello, my name is Baruch, and I'm a program coordinator with Together for Brothers, and I also sit in the steering committee with OIRA. And I think we're all in agreement when we say that zero fares has been very effective. It's working specifically for our most vulnerable communities, such as our refugee communities, newcomers, um, and also our, our low-income communities have benefit, benefited extremely by zero fares. I can tell you um, more times than I like to admit, I've, I've had to ask my share of pity rides uh, when I grew up as a young person in a single-parent household. And, you know, that's not a very good place to be. Oftentimes, it is a roll of the dice whether I would get on the bus 
or walk miles to my destination, oftentimes in the dark, very late hours of the night, which I can tell you is a lot less safer than getting on the bus. And so again, you've heard it all already tonight. You've heard all of the data. You've, you've heard uh, from the people. I uh, just really want to extend um, my, um, my experience and what I've been hearing from a lot of the young people that I work with that zero fares works. Uh, please don't take zero fares away. Um, and again, safety is an issue in various aspects of our lives. So work with us, work with the community so we can create a real solution um, to our safety issues. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. President, if I can say something. So I just, wanted, I just wanted to ask the staff, so this young man is saying, please don't take zero fares away. So I just want, is, if this ordinance were to pass, are we taking zero fares away? Matt, uh, Mr. President, Matt, President uh, Councillor Pena, we are, I guess that comes back to that question as to how zero, the term zero fares were defined. I hate, I'm not trying to vacillate. When we passed the original, when we wrote the original zero fares ordinance, that same question came up, what's free and what's zero? Um, and so the term, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a new term of art as we began this new process of not having charging fares. And so the zero fare was that there's just no fare charged at all. In other words, there's no, nothing required. You just walk on the bus. Um, and so that's what zero fares is. So we will no longer have that system. What we will have is a system of if you, uh, it, it's near total free. I don't want to say it's completely total free because you still, if you have uh, a pass or if you have a certain type of photo ID, you can get on for free. However, if you do not have those items, then yes, you would have to pay for a fare. So, and again, the point was, my understanding, my instructions from the sponsors were to get that access to, so that, to make it, to go as far as we can, to make sure everybody can get um, that ability to get on free by using the pass or, um, or their ID. So that was kind of the goal. Thank you. See. Anita Cordova, followed by Luis Colanga. Thank you for having me this evening. Anita Cordova. I'm a longtime employee of Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless, a board member of Albuquerque Affordable Housing Coalition, and a transit rider. I am here to urge you to retain zero fares and to not implement a bus pass system, a pass system that will create inequities for the people who need this system the most. <clears throat> Any security issues and ones that are clearly defined can be addressed by this community. We have the knowledge in the community to make that happen. Transit riders support safe buses and zero fares. Our transit drivers, people experiencing homelessness, and people who benefit from affordable housing will bear the brunt of any pass system. A pass system will take more time and make our transit drivers gatekeepers, as some will be forced to pay while others must show a variety of passes or identifications. Passes are easily lost, can be stolen, thrown away, discarded, will cost to be replaced. Let's lift up the benefits here to, um, deeply, or to zero, or zero fares. Enhances equity access and equity making Albuquerque more livable. It decreases barriers for riders who can afford to pay and those that cannot afford to pay. It makes boarding easier and faster. Decreases travel times for all who are trying to get to healthcare appointments, housing applications, and review housing. Um, other cities have already found that investing in fare collecting systems costs more than the fares would cover. And the opportunity, it, it offers the opportunity to faster service, increase, increases ridership, improved access, and equity is a far better, better investment for our city. Luis Kalunga, followed by Saeed Mati Hassaini. Hello, my name is Luis. Um, I'm an organizing fellow with Together for Brothers. And I wanted to share how Zero Fares has like, impacted me. Uh, I live in District 6, um, and I have been transit dependent for the past year. <clears throat> uh, and Zero Fares has made it possible for me to get to where I need to go and where I want to go um, by just you know, being available. Because for the most part, I ride my bicycle. Um, but when it gets harder uh, with the tougher conditions, you know, for example, uh, the road on University north of Gibson and south of Central, it's pretty rough. Not a bike route, <clears throat> the road's really harsh. Um, I get flats often. Um, you know, 
most of the time it's easier to take the bus back home and get home all right and safe. So that's what I'll do, um, especially now in the winter and now that it's getting dark. Um, yeah, so, and I also just wanted to share a story over the summer. Uh, we created a zero fares mural with some young men of color. Um, we went out and collected stories and surveys of the most impacted transit dependent bus riders. Uh, and, you know, we got a lot of feedback um, from these surveys um, of how it affected youth, elderly people, and people with disabilities. Um, and so we based the mural off of that. Uh, would want to invite you all to see it at work classroom uh, whenever you can. Um, and yeah, just wanted to kind of share about that. You know, this mural reflects how Zero Fares uh, has made an impact on our community. Uh, it's connected us to the land. Um, and hopefully you all get to see it. Thank you. Saeed Mati Hosani, followed by Patrick Covington. Patrick Covington, followed by Hallie Burt. Mr. President, Counselor, I live in District 6. I'm a proud resident of the International District. There's no place in this town I'd rather live. I'm also 100% service-connected disabled veteran in the United States Air Force with combat service in Southwest Asia and East Africa. I am neither homeless, nor do I regularly and routinely ride the city buses to where I need to get where I need to go. Both of those facts have not always been true. I spent years living street level homeless with untreated, undiagnosed mental illness. At times, I could not afford even token level fares for public transit, nor did I always have photo ID. If you've never lived homeless, you don't understand. You don't always have that piece of paper. You don't always have that document. At times, this prevented me from accessing programs and services intended to assist those in need. I'm here today to urge a rejection of and a no vote on this bill. You can't keep amending bad law. It's still bad law. Let's look at security separate from the fares. No fares for anyone. Step aboard a bus, get where you need to get going. Counselors have been very vocal in local media attempting to wrap this in the rhetoric of crime, crime, crime. When crimes are committed by individuals on city buses, that's a situation that our law enforcement community should be empowered and funded to handle. No fares. Hallie Burt, followed by Joanna Delaney. Joanna Delaney, followed by Jennifer Merriman. Jennifer Merriman, followed by Rebecca Hampton. Oh, good. You know, tonight I've heard, again, last week I heard, the week before that I heard, Policing crime on people, crime on the poor, policing the poor. That's all we keep hearing. There's no causal situation between free bus fare and crime. It's poverty. If you all solve systemically the situation, provide good housing, help give people good working wages, why are the city bus workers dropping off like flies. I wonder what they get paid. I wonder what their schedule's like. Maybe if they were paid, you know, uh, I don't know, $50 an hour, they might stay. Maybe instead of a $250,000 study, you hire bus drivers and you pay them well. You know, one thing that's increased that we keep hearing again and again is rents, 40%. No wages have increased for, for people. Studies throughout the United States. You want data, Mr. Lewis? Data says an increase in poverty is a direct correlation to an increase in crime. You can't police yourself out of this situation. Take care of the city bus workers. Take care of community. Build community 
Don't create more security measures. Build community leaders to welcome and greet people who get on the bus. Hi, Jennifer, how are you doing today? Thank you. Can I help you with your bag? Sit down. Just like they do in a grocery store. Thank you. That's Thank community. You. Time has expired. Rebecca Hampton, followed by Tony Watkins. Um, yeah, so what I've learned tonight is that crime is not increased at all on the bus. So this amendment to the free fares program is based on a myth. Um, so it's clearly crafted to target and criminalize uh, those who struggle to afford bus rides. Um, and yeah, like Jen said, like those bus drivers deserve a raise. They need to get paid. Um, and if you're really worried about crime, you know, same, same thing, like people aren't paid enough, then end poverty that produces the social conditions for crime. And if you care about employees, then raise their wages, increase their benefits, their pensions, et cetera. Pay people a living wage to clean the bus. Pay people a living wage to drive the bus. Um, 40000 is is not enough, especially with rising rents. I mean, they should really be making, yeah, like six figures. Like, why not? Show our bus drivers and the people who clean all the crap off the bus some respect. And, you know, for five months, I had to take the bus from District 1 to District 6 because my car broke. Um, it only came once every 40 minutes, and it would often be 10 to 15 minutes early or late, so I'd miss the bus all the time. And in the evening, I couldn't take the bus home. I had to get rides or Uber because there's no way to get home when I was done working at 9 or 10 p.m. So we need buses expanded, not poor bus riders um, criminalized. Thank you. Tony Watkins, followed by Althea Atherton. Hi, everybody. My name is Tony Watkins. Um, I'm with the New Mexico Coalition to End Homelessness. And I stand with those who have spoken uh, previously in opposing the initiative that would require IDs to access city buses in order to ride for free. Requiring an ID would put an unnecessary barrier for people experiencing homelessness who already face barriers accessing resources. One of those barriers is having or obtaining personal identification. People need the bus to travel to organizations that can provide them with an ID. They also need the bus to access food, medical care, jobs, schools, meeting up with case managers, and many other things. Requiring an ID to do those things would only add to the frustration and drain the resources and time of people experiencing homelessness and those trying to help them. It would also add fuel to the false narrative that criminalizes people experiencing homelessness. In short, 02247 feels like an attempt to invisibilize people experiencing homelessness, to just get them off the buses so we're not reminded of their existence. We can do better than that. We need to put our, extra, we need to put our energies into solutions like increasing case management, affordable housing, and wages rather than ramping up restrictions and criminalizing the most vulnerable people in our communities. Thank you. Althea Atherton, followed by Nicholas Rimmer. Thank you. President Benton, my name is Althea Atherton, and I live in Victory Hills. I'm a transit rider, and I'm also expecting my first child, so public safety has been at the forefront of my mind. And while the number of security calls may have increased this year, so has ridership, which is a good thing. And the percentage of riders experiencing incidents remains steady at that 0.12%. I would feel very safe taking the bus, still, as I do. <laughs> O2247 will worsen bus safety, not address it. As it stands, zero fare does not inflict fare conflicts on us. We don't have to require, to, are not required to get out our wallet or a pass in public. And we have bystanders around us, which um, decreases the chances of people acting violently towards us. Um, and also decreases the anger of our fellow riders if we're going to start collecting fares again. Um, and it also comes with costs, maintaining collection systems, oversight, timeliness, and those difficult conversations would fall back on our bus drivers who are already overburdened. And pardon the pun, but I think it's unfair to expect our bus riders and tourists to either have to choose between paying and sharing their sense of information with the city. I've ridden on many transit systems around this country and I've never been asked to share my date of birth or other sensitive information. Instead, our Transit Advisory Board passed a resolution last month asking you to, to form a committee creating a comprehensive community safety plan. This is a much safer path in a, than imposing a grossly paternalistic system that infringes on our right to privacy. I urge you to not pass this proposal and instead to follow the direction of the Transit Board to bring together stakeholders studying the solutions head on. Thank you. 
Nicholas Rimmer, followed by Roger Culp. Roger Culp, followed by Gregory Sherman. Gregory Sherman, followed by Johnny Size. Johnny Size, followed by Diane Albert. Diane Albert, followed by Jason Santos. Jason Santos, followed by Felipe Rodriguez. Good evening, uh, city councilors. Um, wanted to speak on, on the bus fare. Um, I think that by adding in these sort of uh, extra steps needed to, to get people to, to have that sort of free pass, uh, it's gonna create difficulties that we don't need. Um, I'm worried about people not getting access to the bus. Uh, it's been a, a, a major help so far for many people in the community, being able to access you know, different areas of Albuquerque without having to walk for miles on end through you know, some you know, rough streets and things like that. Um, it has been a major lifesaver for, for many people. Um, towards the issue of, of sort of like our bus drivers and having a shortage of those, again, you know, I think we need to pay them more. We need to give them better benefits and things like that. Uh, we should make that a valued, you know, position in our community. Um, much like uh, Council Member uh, Sanchez, I have family members who were also bus drivers. My grandfather uh, used to drive the bus in New York. Um, he loved his job. He was big fan of, of, of being a bus driver. He got a lot of respect and, you know, um, it was some of the best years of his life because he was paid a decent wage, he can take care of his family and things like that. Uh, and so it was a wonderful experience for him and I think we should recreate that here in Albuquerque. Um, and lastly, I just want to say that, like, you know, we should be thinking about the future of this city. Uh, should this be, you know, a car dependent city or should we be focusing on incentivizing bus use? Uh, because if we can do that, you can, we can lower the ecological you know, impact of, of our, our car-centric city. Uh, we should be incentivizing people to use the bus, and adding passports and things like that is not going to help that. Thank you. Felipe Rodriguez, followed by Josep Arvisu. Josep Arvisu, followed by Jesus Hernandez on Zoom. Jesus Hernandez, followed by Karen Navarro. Hello, everyone. Um, so, sorry. Josette Arviso. Josette Arviso, followed by Jesus Hernandez. Hi, my name is Josette Arviso. I'm the Deputy Director of Progress Now New Mexico. I would like to say that I'd like to keep zero fares. And uh, I'm a part of the Zero Fares Coalition, so I'm strongly in favor of keeping Zero Fares the way it is for all the reasons that have been stated here tonight. I'd like to thank um, Councilors Fiebelkorn and Davis for pointing out the many, many flaws in this ordinance. And I would just like for some common sense solutions that don't break down who deserves to ride the bus by five years old, 10 years old, veteran, Medicaid, Medicare. What are we doing when that's how we're breaking it down? And we'd rather spend money on administrative costs than to pay riders and to provide a public service. Thank you. Jesus Hernandez followed by Karen Navarro. Yeah, hello, my name is Jesus. And uh, I just want to say that Zero First has, has made a huge impact on people and that it has helped a lot of people in so many ways that I think would be very helpful if it stays because not everyone has the opportunity to be able to ride the bus because most people don't have money and are not able to ride because of that. It's important for people with disabilities to have access to free transit 
because most of the time it's hard to get rides from people. So having this opportunity can be so much better for people with disabilities. It gives us a chance to be more independent without having to, to depend on others. We are not able to ride someone without being able to pay if they don't have the funds. Zero fares makes it easier for riders like me in a wheelchair. Karen Navarro, followed by Patrick Parnton. Good evening, counselors. Um, I am speaking in strong opposition to the 040, 047 floor substitute. Yesterday, I did a Google search for stabbing on bus Albuquerque after watching the nightly news. I watched a local news video showing a man boarding a bus and accosting his ex-girlfriend a fight broke out between him and her new boyfriend who then stabbed him. They exited the bus with the new boyfriend continuing to stab him. This incident occurred in 2015, seven years before zero fares. Anecdotal, yes. Caused by zero fares, no. What's more, violence in the form of road rage, which I've experienced, carjackings, people wielding weapons that kill or injure others in parking lots, on sidewalks, in apartments, and in vehicles has also increased. So this is all tragic, but obviously not related to zero fares. This floor substitute is a red herring. Trans security and APD already have a process for tracking people who cause problem on the buses. This floor substitute will burden the very understaffed transit department with new bureaucracy, bureaucracy that will cost $150,000 to $200,000 to implement. This is counterintuitive. Spending all that money to set aside money for bus drivers, counterintuitive. So I ask the counselors to please vote no on, the, on this floor substitute. And regarding the bus shortage, uh, I have learned that bus drivers Thank get you, $15 an hour. So they need to get more than $15 an hour. Thank, Thank you. you. Lastly. Patrick Martin. Hi, my name is Patrick Martin and I'm a bus user and cyclist living in District 6. And I'd like to remind everyone of what non-zero fares was like by sharing my experience when I first moved to Albuquerque. Um, I was in Nob Hill looking at apartments and I needed to go to Bloom Fiesta Park for some job related processing. And this wouldn't be an issue. Um, I could buy a day pass at the nearby art station and take a pair of buses to get there. It'd be pretty easy. The problem is that the machine there wouldn't take my card, and when I gave it my last dollar bills, it ate them without printing me a pass. So when people talk about the convenience of zero fares, they're not just talking about how simpler the boarding process is and how you don't need to keep track of fares and passes anymore. It also means that we aren't subject to the whims of pass machines as to whether we can even use the bus system here. It means not watching passengers fumble with the payment at the front of the bus or try to convince the, the driver to let them ride for free. Zero Fares has been amazing. I really urge you to continue this program definitely. Thank you. That concludes comment. All right, counselors, we're finished with public comment. Um, sponsors want, and, and we have uh, substituted the bill for the uh, floor substitute. So um, is there a motion for a deferral? Um, Mr. President, before we do that, I just wanted to ask just a, a clarifying question from the Director of, of Transit on Sunban, if you can. So on the Sunban, um, do, they, do people who utilize the Sunban still have to fill out an application? Uh, Council President, Councillor Pena, yes, they do still have to go through the process of filling out the application to ensure that they meet the ADA requirements. So, um, so if someone misses like a pickup because they forgot to cancel an, an appointment after three, do they still get um, suspended from Sunvan? For missed pickups, if they have so many, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how many. Um, yes, they would have their they would have suspension. Often. Okay, thank you. Thank you, just wanted to clarify that. So, and, and the only reason I did that was because again, I mean, I, I'm just gonna end it, we're gonna um, hopefully defer it now, but I just wanted to say that again, um, free fares, support free fares, supported it from the beginning, supported the, st the study to increase um, 
transit drivers pays, pay, um, support, it, support the study to come up with a, um, a plan. Councillor Lewis um, is proposing this um, ordinance that addresses public safety, an attempt to, um, to address public safety on the bus. And you know, I would just say to, to others, because it's easy to say we don't like it, but I hope that it, you know, if this doesn't pass, that um, of course we have the security plan um, moving forward, but I hope that somebody you know comes up with something about um, to address uh, public safety on the bus because we dear did hear from lots of people anecdotal. I was looking and looking um, through my phone for some emails that I'd received from people who were transit drivers that were saying that they needed um, help on the bus, they needed more security, and we are. So I just wanted to say to some of the folks that are here, we are. We have been putting money into into. Um, uh, transit and to address the shortage and to address um, 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 safety on the bus. I talked about it earlier, how we had put money in to even clean the buses. And I really do believe that um, one of the things that I talked to Councillor Lewis about was that really um, public safety is not just about um, um, some of the criminal activity that may or may not be happening on the bus, but it's about better lighting, it's about clean bus stops, it's about making sure that things there at the bus stops work, like some of the signage that direct people who who um, need that um, is in place. So, you know, just look forward to continuing to work with everyone to try to do what we can to make this a better bill. And if we take out the, the public safety part of it, well then, you know, I, I know that as, um, as a counselor um, and, and being on council, that we know that you know, if we hear from constituents about safety on the buses, even though I support free fares, when you hear about that, you can't just ignore that. And and I just I'll I'll end with that. Um, I'll motion for a deferral. Uh, I don't know how long did you want to do, Councillor Lewis? Thirty days. Mm -hmm. Third for thirty days. So that would be till December fifth. And we did pass the floor substitute. I had that wrote. Okay, thanks. So we're, uh, no other comments. We'll move to a vote uh, for the substitution. All, uh, excuse me, for the, for the deferral. I beg your pardon. So this is on the deferral to December 5th. All those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Yes. Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll now move to M6, Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, M6 is asking the New Mexico legislature to reinstate qualified immunity. Um, I move to pass. There's a motion and a second. And Councillor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, one of the things that we're looking for is we're li was, is the support for law enforcement officers. Everybody knows that I'm a retired law enforcement officer, and we went over some statistics just earlier in the meeting in reference to the fact that when I was a law enforcement officer back in 1989, we had 640 field officers. Now we only have 297, which is a disparity of 343 officers. So. Um, our department's smaller now than it was in 1989 when I started. Um, right after that, the chief that came on was Joe Polazar, and he had an authorized strength of, um, I think it was 900, and he ended up leaving with 927. So he built the department uh, d during the time that I was there. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we need to see happening um, within our area, and I know right now that, that uh, it's, it's one of the things that, that, in my opinion, is hampering the growth of our law enforcement agencies around the state is the fact that we no longer have qualified immunity. Um, we can't hire officers. We can't retain officers. And our officers need our support. They need um, the citizen support, the department support. And we need to make sure that we give them um, the support that they need to do their jobs. Um, one of the things that officers are is they're public service, uh, so public safety employees who put their lives on the line for us each and every day and have to make a decision in a split second um, in, that could change any, that could change his life 
or another person's life in a, in a microsecond. So, um, and I know for a fact that no officer, not one officer that is assigned to any police department in the United States of America that goes through the vetting process that officers go through, um, starting out with a very large number of officers and then dwindling down to a very small, minute number of officers, te testing their integrity at every level, uh, including the police academy, after the academy, before the academy, I mean, on and on and on. And then the amount of contacts with officers. You know, the average, the average person doesn't make a lot of contacts with, with police, but the police officer makes a lot of contacts with, an individ with individuals as, as they go throughout their day. And there's millions and millions and millions of contacts that go on, and those contacts are good contacts, solid. As I said before, no officer goes into any of this, it goes into his job wanting to hurt somebody or violate anybody's rights. I honestly believe that every single officer goes into that profession wanting to do their job. And there is systems in place that make sure that they do their job um, to, the, to their best of the ability and, and stay within the scope of their employment. I think it's really, really important. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to make sure that the officers have a tool to make sure that they can understand that they can go out and do their job the way they're supposed to do their job um, without, without having to worry about it. And that's the purpose of this. And like I said, we're, we're looking at a memorial. We're just asking the legislature to uh, look at it. Um, depending on the makeup of the legislature, that's how that goes, but um, asking for your support. Davis, I think you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Really quickly, I, I know it's getting late, and um, I suspect um, that the votes on this are probably already set. But um, I think Councillor Sanchez and I get a chance to play the. I was the former cop a little while, and see, uh, and often see very much. And we had a conversation earlier today um, that there are a few pieces of legislation coming up around public safety that I think folks will be surprised to see that we're both going to support because I think there are some critical pieces we have to do um, to support our officers to make our city safer and stronger. But I think this is one of those that is not required. Um, I was a cop too. Um, I was involved in an officer involved shooting. You read about it in the Albuquerque Journal and in every negative political ad. Every time I've run, somebody's brought it back up. Um, but I also understand the importance of doing this job and doing it right and setting the right example. And I agree with you, Counselor. I don't think anybody goes into this job expecting to break the rules or violate the law or to violate someone's constitutional rights or unlawfully take away their life. If that's absolutely not the last required option. But the fact is we have some bad apples and sometimes they do. And sometimes folks act with such careless disregard for the life and the safety um, of our community and of others that they have to be held responsible. And quite frankly, the history of policing in this country is that uh, certain public officials, including uh, police officers especially, have not been held accountable for that. And part of that is that they aren't held personally responsible for the things that other people in their everyday daily lives and their daily jobs will be held for. And one of the things that I'm really proud that New Mexico has done is taking that first step to set the rules for police officers and require department cities that choose to in, in, uh, employ them. We don't have to have a police department here. We could have state police and the sheriff. But we choose to do that, which means we have an obligation to train them right, to set the rules right, um, and to take on some of that responsibility to be sure they're doing the right thing. And our city has done wrong by them in the past. Um, we have done a good job of recruiting new officers. Um, what we've seen is that we're seeing more retirements from, from older uh, generations of officers um, for lots of reasons that I understand. But if you call 911 today, there's a 90% chance you're going to get an officer who came to this department expecting to wear a camera, hoping to ride a bike or walk a foot beat again, do some of that community policing work under the new standards that have been set to ensure we have a constitutional police department. And um, the fact is, we simply did not. And we were doing it wrong for a really long time and paying the cost. Um, I think it's incumbent on us to have it is not unreasonable for us to expect that our public officials, including our police officers, follow the law, don't violate the Constitution, and serve and protect in an honorable way. And if someone's not able or willing to set that expectation upon themselves and on others, 
um, then they shouldn't work here. And for that reason, I think that uh, the state has taken an important first step uh, in trying to hold our officers accountable and set a new national standard. And I hope that the legislature would continue to uh, uphold that uh, expectation, even if this council does vote uh, to encourage them to do so. And so I won't be supporting anything that would repeal uh, the current status uh, of our uh, protections uh, and our expectations for our police officers. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, uh, I'm, I'm not a fan. I know I've said this repeatedly, and I'm going to keep saying it. I'm not a fan of the, it's a nationwide problem. My mom always used to say, I don't care about everyone else. I care about you, right, when I'm telling her how my grades are in school. Um, but it really is about Albuquerque, right? This is about who we are and what we're doing. So um, I'm hearing tonight on multiple legislation that, it's a nationwide problem and we need to deal with that and we need to accept it. But yet on this, there are some that are saying, this is a specific problem, so we need to now have a specific avenue. And I don't agree with that. I think that we did have a problem that we did need to rectify. And I believe that APD is working very hard to do so and has come a long way. Um, I don't think that on one hand we should say let's keep zero fares and ignore the bad apples, and then on the other hand, say APD has bad apples and we should punish them all. So I think that we do need to find a way to be consistent. I do think APD has come a long way. I do think they're working really hard. I still think they, along with everyone else, including me and, and every creature, has to make progress. But that doesn't mean that we need to go and, and cherry pick little portions of one thing and not be consistent on another. And I, and I think it's sad that that's what we're talking about in some of those details. So I really hope that we do end up protecting those. Um, the other nationwide problem that we did hear about tonight too, for the record, is you know, um, there's more, there's more um, police shootings and, and killings than ever. And there's more homicides and murders than ever. So again, we can't cherry pick half the information. That's a common theme that we're saying tonight. And it's going to apply here as well. And so um, I think that, you know, I would hope that we're all consistent in some of the arguments that we're making, no matter which way we decide to go. Um, but I definitely support APD. I am proud of where, they are, where they've come from um, or how they're progressing. And I think that we do need to support that. And thereby, I will absolutely be supporting the memorial. Councillor Pena and then Councillor Peeble. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. So on the memorial, I'm looking for it. I went and shuffled through everything this evening, so I messed up my paperwork here. But um, I was just wondering if legal can explain some of the changes on the um, for the memorial in terms of uh, in, in terms of the um, oh I lost my I wrote it down and then I lost it. If a police officer is personally responsible, like can they be sued? Are you asking whether an individual officer can now be sued under the current state of the law? Yes. Yes, they can, and we have, um, there have been lawsuits filed against individual officers at APD. And so, a, you know, obviously a memorial is just here again asking, urging, you know, the, the state and like I've mentioned before, I have such a hard time with some of these memorials, but I did one myself. So um, if, OK, OK, you answered my question. I had a, an additional question, but I, I lost where I, what I wrote down. So thank you. Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, I also support APD and was wondering if the city or APD has a position on this memorial. Mr. President and Councillor Fiebelkorn, um, obviously we support along the lines that Councillor Davis just described, accountability for public, public servants uh, that includes law enforcement, ensuring that we're focused on that, but also in, we've taken the perspective that uh, We've got to look at major issues, all the Metro Crime Initiative issues that are before the legislature are issues that we believe are going to support not only our 
law enforcement community, but our courts and our prosecutors. Uh, and those are the bigger agenda items for us moving forward. And so um, we want to continue to move in that direction. And look, we don't want to create such an issue with in Santa Fe that we're debating all these issues on every front. These other issues are much more important, we believe, in terms of helping solve the crime issues in our community and, and really providing resources to our law enforcement community to do a better job and to continue to, to work on behalf of the city. Thank you, Mr. Rael. I, I just want to say I don't think that there will be any um, major problem at the Roundhouse on this. This bill just passed on, in 2021 um, with really huge margins. Um, so I don't foresee any changes, but thank you for the city's perspective. Councilor Pena. I didn't find it, but how did the state law change in terms of from prior to, to now with the current, the current um, state law? Um, you know, so in my understanding, and, and I'm not sure I'm remembering correctly, but under the prior law, the, the lawsuit would be asserted only against the institution, the, the, the municipal institution, and now it can be sued against, now it can be asserted against the individual officers with, with some limits. So then personally, their families, everyone can, the, their entire family would be affected by the, ch by the change, correct? That is possible. I mean, there's, there's, poss there's a possibility of a judgment, yes. Yeah, I, I just have some other questions. I just want to... I just want to, I think I'd like to ask for a deferral for 30 days, just so that I can get some questions answered. I'll second that motion. Is there any discussion that would be the precedent? Mr. President, we don't have answers to those questions tonight. We do, I think we'd, why don't we ask the questions and see if we don't have answers to them. The, the motion for a deferral takes precedent to mm -hmm. another dis separate discussion, I believe. Mr. President, uh, yes, that's correct. So we have a motion and a second to defer, and so that takes precedent over debate of the bill at this point. You can debate the motion to defer. Um, however, I do want to point out that we do have a number of folks signed up for this bill as well to speak, and so similar to the prior deferrals, you might want to take their uh, commentary before taking a vote. Yeah, we have uh, 12 people signed up to speak, um, but uh, so that's, that's, that'll be up to the will of the council whether uh, we want to hear them before we vote on the deferral motion, but the deferral motion is what's on the, on before us now. Councilors? Okay. So we'll... We'll, we'll go ahead and uh, go to public comment. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Morgan Hobson, followed by Jordan Newlander. I'm back. Um, so I'm just curious how, first of all, um, some of you mentioned that you believe no cops have bad intentions when it is well documented. Like, um, Dor Derek Chauvin was, had 17 reports against him before he put a knee on George Floyd's neck and murdered him. Um, George Zimmerman sold the gun that he killed a black child, Trayvon Martin, with for $250,000. So that's just egregious to me. Um, according to research from the Cato Institute, which is public policy, and Research Center, 66% of Americans now support repealing the doctrine uh, of qualified immunity so that citizens can sue public uh, police for wrongful misconduct. In most police forces, less than 10% of officers are investigated for misconduct, and that means most of these officers often have lengthy track records and that police departments aren't letting bad officers go, like Derek Chauvin. Police groups have also recognized the harm that qualified immunity does to the profession, Police appropriately have many protections to ensure that they can do their job. Huge numbers of cases against police are dismissed as frivolous. And the Fourth Amendment protects officers so long as their conduct was reasonable under the circumstance. But qualified immunity is an arbitrary standard that goes beyond the protections providing cover for bad officers. Law enforcement action partnership quote, in order to improve public safety, we need to build trust in law enforcement. And in order to build trust, 
There must be transparency and accountability. As such, we believe it is crucial to end a legal doctrine that has contributed to the erosion of public trust in the justice system and made all of us less Thank safe. You, your time's and I'm an abolitionist, so I come in the Jordan Newlander, followed by Cynthia Rodriguez. Cynthia Rodriguez, followed by Kevin Branham. Hi, I'm Cynthia Rodriguez. I'm an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, so there is a record of APD acting in uh, not in good faith. In fact, they're in, they had the consent decree that they had to agree to in 2014 after uprising, after APD murdered James Boyd, and it became, it was nationalized. I mean, the, it had national attention. Again, just this year, again, APD had national attention because they, they murdered, they killed a 15-year-old boy in a fire. So the idea that they shouldn't be held personally accountable for destroying people's lives is ridiculous. Um, you should, in fact, be in. You you should be charging these people. You should be jailing killer cops, holding them personally accountable for the actions that they're doing. They are actively destroying our communities. The idea that that you can you can criminalize people for not being able to afford the bus, and you want to pick and you're saying pick and choose like who's bad and who's not. You have a doctrine that says that APD, yeah, APD has a pattern of escalating situations and using extreme and lethal force. The Department of Justice found that. You can't shake your head at it. They literally did. You had to sign a contract and get into that. They had to because they do it time and time again. You have to hold them accountable. Kevin Brownham, followed by Ben Imbus. Ben Imbus, followed by Jason Santos. Jason Santos, followed by Jose Enriquez. Uh, ben is in the, in the bathroom uh, currently, but so I don't know if you want him to speak first. Uh, ben? Okay. Uh, good evening, city councilors. Um, I wanted to address some of the points that you guys are bringing up, um, specifically uh, Council Member uh, Sanchez. Um, you talked a lot about how we're short on officers, uh, but recently, uh, earlier today, we, we just had the chief uh, talk about how this is a nationwide problem. And as New Mexico is one of the four places that doesn't have uh, qualified immunity, I'm wondering where you're getting the data that in, uh, putting it back in place would increase our retention and recruitment rates um, because it seems like all across the nation, even where qualified immunity is in place, uh, they're still struggling to hold on to cops. So, um, you know, if you can clarify that, uh, that would be very helpful. Um, doesn't seem like it's going to improve our police, um, you know, department at all. Um, as others have said, it has a history of being violent and, and using force. And for those officers who, you know, you say are have good intentions, uh, they really shouldn't, you know, worry about qualified immunity because it'll never be a problem for them because, as you said, they're going to follow the law. So I, I don't see who this is helping. Uh, if we're worried about crime here in New Mexico, we should be trying to solve issues of poverty. We should be getting more access to affordable housing, better access to health care, and, and things like that. Uh, we should not be trying to strengthen... Uh, the, the legal uh, rights of, of our police officers. That does nothing for recruitment. It does nothing for uh, lowering crime. Um, it actually does nothing at all. This is kind of a waste of time. Thank you. Thank you. Ben Imbus, followed by Jose Enriquez. Yeah, I just want to uh, second the sentiment that um, if, we're, if, we're, if we're trying to attract police officers to the field, with the prospect that they won't be accountable, that seems like a, a self-defeating policy. Um, I want to agree again with the sentiment, if we're concerned about crime, which we are, we need to address poverty. That's what, that's what we need to be doing. Serve your community. Do the right thing, please. 
Jose Enriquez, followed by Roger Culp. Jose Enriquez, organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation and Union Carpenter. I'm urging the council to vote no on the Memorial 22-6, which will ask the state to reinstate qualified immunity. I work in construction, which is an industry that's more dangerous than policing. There are many accidents, and some of these accidents are unfortunately fatal. When a fatality occurs on the job site, there's a huge investigation to find out who was at fault, and afterwards, fines are issued out, lawsuits are filed, and in certain circumstances, when there's a certain degree of negligence, people are sent to jail. This is the case in all industries, and should also include police departments. Reinstating qualified immunity, which was fought and won by local residents taking the streets en masse during the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020, will create a moral hazard. Without repercussions for their actions, police will be emboldened to brutalize suspects, continue racist police killings, which are all things that need to be put to an end. Cops that brutalize suspects and murder people need to be fired, prosecuted, and jailed, not protected. People like to say that being a cop is a dangerous job. Statistically, it's safer than being a pizza delivery driver. Cops don't need qualified immunity, especially APD, which continues to engage in acts of brutality, police killings, and has killer cops on the beat. If people aren't joining APD because there's no qualified immunity, then I do personally question their character and motive. There's a lot of concern over encampments and homelessness, and the solution to this is more housing and not more policing and not protecting killer cops. Roger Culp, followed by Jennifer Merriman. Jennifer Merriman, followed by Rebecca Hampton. Jennifer Merriman's here. Okay. Um, real quick, there's a flaw to the argument of we can't have vote no, fair, and yes, this or that. It's because one has power. You all have power. So when you're thinking about those arguments, think about who is holding the power. So my name is Jennifer Merriman. I'm a PHP organizer, and I'm asking you to vote no against M226. The DOJ consistently, year after year, cited APD's noncompliance with the reform effort, and even worse, a culture of resisting the reforms. APD is not reformed. How can you trust an APD culture that turns continues to terrorize people with brutality and excessive force, continues racist police murders, doesn't release body cam fo footage, doesn't demand their own members to be fired, prosecuted, or jailed. The culture of one voice, one shield, one blue uniform is a terror force that cannot be trusted to monitor itself. Do not pass M22-6. I'm just still thinking, because I've got 18 more seconds, about how the power to put forth a bill or a legislative document that's not thought through has such a domino effect to bring people out, working people. I love the Zoom thing on the red herring. Let's think about that. There's a lot of red herring, herrings going on. Rebecca Hampton, followed by Rebecca Armijo. Um, yeah, this memorial is, it's offensive. Um, earlier this year, the city of Albuquerque announced that APD had achieved some goals of the court-ordered consent decree reform process and would be allowed to self-monitor. Uh, this outrageous announcement came just one month after APD officers were involved in an interagency SWAT operation that burned down a family home, brutally killing a black 15-year-old child, Brett Rosanoff. Mere weeks after that announcement, officers were involved in another racist murder when they fired 16 rounds at 27-year-old Keyshawn Thomas, a black Latino man sleeping in his vehicle at a gas station. It is clear to the public that APD has not reformed its behavior and that our community is not safe from being senselessly murdered by racist killer cops. Individual police officers should be held accountable for civil rights violations. If I killed someone, I would get a trial and face consequences and go to jail. But if a cop unjustly kills someone, they get a paid vacation and no consequences. 
There's no way to justify it. It's totally unfair. We should have the right to sue a police officer as an individual if they violate civil rights. We need justice for victims of police terror and to jail killer cops to keep our community safe, not try and release, um, you not try and reinstate qualified immunity. Thanks. Rebecca Armijo. Good evening, President Benton, counselors. Um, I think I shared a couple of times ago, a couple of meetings ago, that we are small business owners and have been in Albuquerque for 30 years. However, over the past few years, specifically since um, 2017, our business has been broken into nine times. The ninth time was last Monday, and we are in Councillor Feeblecorn's district. You know, it's kind of ironic that on a Monday morning, 7.30 in the morning, high traffic, you know, very high, high traffic street that we can be broken into and nobody see it, nobody say anything, then police officers aren't able to show up for quite a few hours, even told on the phone that it would be numerous hours before police officers could get to us, um, which they did when they got there. They said they were sorry, they were overwhelmed with crime in our city. Because we still had to conduct a business, we have to clean up you know, all of the, the crime scene, which means then there's not the evidence when the cops get there. Maybe fingerprints aren't there anymore. So I would bet my meager paycheck that whoever committed the crime at our business was repeat offenders. See, I think that Crime is out of control, and I do support the memorial because I do believe that some of those things are keeping good people from wanting to become cops in APD. Mr. President, that concludes public comment. Mr. President, may I clarify um, the answer that I gave previously to Councillor Pena? Uh, I just wanted to, to clarify two remarks. One is that, of course, it's not just police officers who can be named in a lawsuit. This is applies to public officials generally. Um, but also, as a general matter, the public body indemnifies those officers, so it's the public body that pays the judgment. All right, we are um, back on the motion for a deferral. This would be till <laughs> December 5th, as I understand it. Uh, Councillor, you said a month, so roughly the 5th of December. Yeah, I was just going to respond, but I'm, I'm good. We can talk about another. Okay, we so are. I just wanted to talk about the qualified immunity, and that was actually what, what some of my remarks were, which I just lost, and I just gave up, because I figured we could talk about it the next time, but I appreciate you answering that, because that's um, that whole rule that talked about um, public officials, mayor, counselors, um, um, police officers, the whole nine yards. So, okay. Yeah, thank you. Councilor Lewis? Uh, no, we're, we're finished with public comment. We're on the deferral. That's the, the order business. So uh, there's a motion and a we're second. We're still on uh, discussion among counselors, correct? No, we're we're on a vote on a deferral. So there's not a discussion amongst counselors. So until we do that vote on deferral, there's a discussion on the deferral, correct? <laughs> you can you can discuss the deferral. I'd, I'd like to, Mr. President. I apologize. I just needed to. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, and just a quick question: Does the does the I, I just want to know if the administration supports this this memorial? Um, do you feel like it'll help us? Uh, it'll help us with the, or hurt us with the police officers and supporting our officers and being able to recruit uh, officers? Mr. President and Councillor Lewis, I responded earlier to Councillor Feeblecorn that the administration supports the accountability that's um, in the current law. All of us as uh, elected officials and or public officials, public servants, are all held accountable. I also said that we are very interested in moving forward with our MCI agenda that deals much more with the prosecution, the support of law enforcement with more uh, tools in their tool bag, if you will, to be able to support fighting crime in the city. And, um, and so at this point, that's where we are. Mr. President. Yeah, you don't support this memorial? Mr. President and Councillor uh, Lewis, 
I don't get to go on this memorial, and neither does the mayor. This is a city council process. I just said that we support accountability of all uh, public officials. I mean, if you, if you, um, you have to defend it if we, if we pass it. So you could see why I'd be interested if, I guess you're in support of it, but, or not. But anyways, all right, thanks, Mr. President. Second for a deferral. Mr. Mr. President, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the meeting so we can make, actually make the vote and have further discussion if we need to. Um, or suspend the rules. All right, there's a motion to uh, extend the meeting by 15 minutes, is that? Yes. All right, until uh, 1045, all those in favor say yes. yes. And raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? No. And that passes. All right, uh, uh, Councillor, uh, so, so we're back on the, uh, the uh, vote for deferral. Councillor Sanchez. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd urge the vote today. Um, one of the things that's important, uh, that's very, very important, is we're sitting here with 110 homicides. I'm listening to the public. And it's obvious the administration does not state whether they support it or don't. Um, they're floundering. So um, what I'm seeing is that the administration needs to support their officers in order to gain more. And it's what I've said all along is that the administration needs to support their officers. And this is something that would help the, off the officers have the support that they need from the administration. The officers talk about different issues. They talk about different things all the time. Right now, um, with this bid that I talked about, with 297 officers bidding, you're going to be lucky if you have four officers um, working your area in the city um, when this bid goes through and, it, and it's at full strength. So that is a catastrophic issue. We are at crisis level within the Albuquerque Police Department and our crime is out of control. That is where we're at. That is the item that we are dealing with. Everybody in here knows and everybody in here has been or seen, have been victimized or has seen it in front of your face. The shopliftings, the illegal drug use everywhere. The crime is out of control in our city and if we could actually add to, to help these officers and to back them up, then I think that we would have uh, a lot better city moving forward. It's, it's a major, major issue that we're dealing with within the city of Albuquerque. And the, and the citizens are noting it. The citizens are talking to all of us. Every single one of us in here gets calls every single day in reference to the crime in their districts and in their areas. And that's what we're dealing with here, is we're dealing with the issues and hiring officers, making sure that they have the support that they need. And that's what we need to hear. We need to hear that you have the officers back in every instance. And those are the things that, that the citizens need to hear. Those are the things that we up here need to hear, and this is a tool to make sure that that happens. Thank you. All right, we're back on the, the, the comments need to be addressed to the need or lack thereof of a deferral. This is requested by Councillor Pena. It's been, been moved and seconded. So any further discussion must be about why we should not be deferring this now. Uh, Councilor Pena expressed her reasons for wanting to be deferred. So uh, unless there are any other discussion, uh, let's get to the vote on the deferral. If that fails, then uh, we can continue with the debate. So all those in favor of the deferral till uh, December 5th, raise your hand, say yes. Yes. And opposed? Uh, that. <laughs> that that passes on a uh, let, let's see the raise raise of a hand for uh, for deferral for deferral just to check again yes this is for the deferral five okay and that passes on a five to uh, three vote and uh, no further business uh, this meeting is adjourned
Recording stopped.